Alright people, alright. Inna alhamdulillahi wa kafah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-mustafa. Wa ala ibadihi al-ladhin artada. Wa man bihudahu mihtada. Fa bi athari ahli al-madina tiqtafa wa ba'ad. Fa salamu allahi ala al-qawm. Ahlan wa sahlan bikum. Wa marhaban. Alright people, alright. So, let me just... Share the link. All right, see if that gets shared out. It does. All right, people. You're doing it. You're doing it, people. You're doing it. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ahlan wa sahlan. Vampire greetings, even though. <laughs> Vampiric Ramadan greetings, I guess. So what is going on, people? What is going on? All right, all right, all right. Ahmed Shaib, you're doing it, you're doing it. Oh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. All right, what is going on, yaar? Kaho <laughs> Nothing. I was just on your fan Discord right now. We were playing some games. <laughs> on my fan Discord? <laughs> yeah. Who in it? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> playing games at these hours. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I have a I have my final GCSE exams on Monday, but who's got time for revision? Yeah. What is this life except Laibun <laughs> Wallahu? Huh? Mm. It's just uh, <laughs> That's all it is, people. It's just entertainment. So, what's going down? What's what's uh, what? What are the tahkik are you up to? You're always up to some kind of tahkik. Um, nowadays tahkik. Um, I'm actually. Um, we've been talking about the calendar issue. So, um, of course, it's a kind of ijma and tawatur that obviously Islam is a purely lunar calendar. Mm. But um. Some Quranists, mm. they've been they've been coming Ijma up with, and tawatur. of the usulin of the usulin, achha, not the muhaddith. Yeah, yeah. So they uh they say that it's supposed to be luni solar. Uh, but the thing is, their arguments are purely um theoretical. There's no evidence like historically for their claims of uh, mm. it being other. Why do you, why do you think it it's not meant to be luni solar? Well, that would be the, the, the question I would uh, pose then. Well, why would they think it is Luni Solar? Um, generally, I mean, these issues are, um, I mean, it, it comes back to how Islamic do you think these issues are? As in, are they a, a matter of the faith? Or are, are we speaking just his, historically? What did the Arabs of that region in that time what do we assume that they went by mm. um when we look at matters like uh, the um, the lunar calendar it does appear uh, that they went to they went along with what may have been the jewish mm. um calendar which was dependent on both it was yeah. lunar but it used the solar calendar to rectify that within, I believe, a 19-year cycle. And, and yeah. I do actually think that is more accurate. The, um, but the thing about the Jews using the lunisolar calendar, the, they say that this would, have, this would have happened during the Babylonian exile. So even if you were to use Islamic terminologies, it would have been a bid'ah of the Jews. So, What do you, what do you mean a bid'ah of the Jews? Like it, it wouldn't have been their original solar calendar. Like um, so most people in most tafsir about nasi, they yeah. say that they would um nasi included both the shuffling and it included the uh the intercalation the kabisa. Yeah, yeah. But um, there's there's uh two groups of scholars. Some say that shuffling never happened, but intercalation happened. Some mm -hmm. say intercalation never happened, but shuffling happened. So there's uh there's different opinions and it's quite. 
confusing. Yeah. I, I would I would personally find myself in line with those people that do argue for the intercalation that mm. there was a month, this nasi was a month, and it was in line. Uh, it was used every there was a system on when and how to use it. It wasn't just it wasn't just cyclical uh, in the sense that every um, you know every three years you add a um, every three years you add a a month but it had to be incorporated in such a way that it it balanced out and um, yeah so I, I would feel that and that was what the and maybe some people were misusing it you see, that would also give more meaning to the names of the months. Mm. Yeah. So I, I would definitely, it. you see, for the months to be reasonably static would make sense. As opposed to, um, so Rabia being in spring. Spring. Yeah. Um, you know, Jamadi al Ula, the, these things being in winter, uh, the sacred months also being those months that were used for either harvest or used for the, um, you know, the, the kind of primary season months. It just makes more sense than a free flowing kind of yeah. calendar. Uh, that's what I'd assume. But why do you feel any of this is a problem? Uh, the problem would be, um, this is why, like, uh, this happened during the start of Ramadan, so I got a bit scared at the start, but then afterwards I've started getting a bit uh, less uh, doubtful that it would, the, the implication would be that we as Muslims are using the incorrect calendar. Incorrect calendar, or, or as in we're mistiming it? Yeah. Right, okay, yeah, I mean, we possibly are. But I don't think that makes a difference. Uh, I don't think that's the goal um, mm. behind. So it depends what we mean by using the wrong calendar. We're using the same calendar. So it's still Ramadan. It's still, you know, uh, going to be Muharram and Safar and all these months are the same months. Except for a very long time, it's gone into this kind of like a free floating cycle. So yeah. it just kind of just rotates around the year. Now, this has its own virtues and merits, but it does lose out on some where it loses, it gains, where it gains, it loses. So um, on one hand, one could argue that the season of Hajj or the season of Ramadan now is found right throughout the year. Mm. Um, which I suppose in some ways is a blessing for certain people who live in certain regions of this globe that can participate differently. Because, you know, if you lived in a certain part that's just pure, you know, six months night or six months day, or if you, or even it, it, just near to those regions um, where there's excessive daylight. So it kind of gives um, more availability to certain people. So yeah. that's a blessing. But is it a problem in the sense that now we are, let's say what was meant to be Ramadan in the eyes, of, in the eye of, in the uh, in knowledge of God? Yeah. Okay. What is that Ramadan? <laughs> when yeah. does that happen? Because if this is just you know, free floating around the, the year, then that actual Ramadan may be static. But I, so although that argument I feel is correct, but I don't feel as incorrect from a perspective, but I feel that, that they're missing the point that in, in, in the sight of God, Ramadan as a fixed static month was not never the objective anyway. Mm. It wasn't... Um, it wasn't about particular calendars. That was never, you know, that's not what Allah was trying to get us to celebrate or do things. It was just setting a time, which Muslims are doing and have been doing, whether they've allowed it to kind of free float throughout annually or remain static. To me, it's neither here, neither there. It doesn't make a difference. But yeah, yeah. because uh, some people's like Ramdi Sahib, I read his tafsir, he said that the... Um, the making of Hajj into a static season was actually why did Allah call it Ziyadatul Fil Kufr? He said that it was because they used to make Hajj be in the winter and they would get lots of good trade. So they made Hajj into a tijara when it was supposed to be, when it was supposed to be moving and it was supposed to be accessible 
for people in the Arabian Peninsula and in the wider world. So that's his argument. And then you also come into the issue that, um, like, for example, you, we, uh, you believe in the living tradition. Alhamdulillah, I do as well. So the, the issue would come in that if this aspect of the living tradition can come into question, then other aspects should as well, such as salah or hajj or zakah. As in to question them? Yeah. Mm, I see. Right. Um, you see, about the hajj being misused, I don't think that argument works. Why? Because... Um, you know, in the Ziyadatan fil Kufr, Hajj was really only in the last year of the of Islam, or arguably people would say one year before with Abu Bakr, but really in the final year of Islam. Now, I don't think in that one year people managed to to do so much. If you're saying, well, no, this was the Hajj of the Kufar, that they yeah. were mistreating it. Yeah, they were misusing it. Mm, right. I think there would still be problems because when we look at the Hajj of the um, of the Kuffar or of pre-Islam, um, it is interesting that <coughs> you see they actually had a calendar for where the the Mosum. So the Mosum was actually a uh, like a trade festival. Okay, now the Mosum would take place, which became Mosum al Hajj, but the Mosum would take place in a different region each month, and it would it would begin with places like um, you know Hira up in Iraq, and it would come around. And people like Patricia Crone and other people have done a lot of research in showing the Meccan trade route, and they've uh, in discussing the Meccan trade route, where they've discussed these trade routes using um, a lot of translations of old um, of old data from Greek and and other uh, findings to show where these. Um, where these occurrences were. So they did used to, it is true, they would come to Arafat and they would have their kind of Muslim there and then they would have their day of uh, celebration and things like this. But they never used to go to Mecca and the Meccans wouldn't often not join them. Yeah. They would just stay in, in stay the Kaaba, yeah, around the Kaaba. So I can't really see, hmm, I don't know, but it may be difficult for them if they were working within a uh, almost somewhat of an international framework, a regional, because it would have been dealing with the Southern Arabian kingdoms, the Middle Kingdoms, the Northern Kingdoms, right up to Iraq. I don't know if they would have had such influence. I doubt it because Mecca was not as popular as people think it was. Um, post Islam, there's an assumption that Mecca was incredibly popular. It wasn't actually very popular. At Would all. it have been popular in Arabia, or do you mean like overall, like globally? No, even in Arabia, I don't think Mecca was very popular at all. Um, it just became popular after Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. But because if even if you remember the incident, uh, the famous narration of Abraha, you see, because what was famous were places like Ta'if. They were mm -hmm. famous, they were popular, but Mecca was not. And hence, it's not on any map, historical map. Any map uh, predating Islam, you don't find Mecca on it. You find Yathrib, you find Ta'if, even on the trade routes where all these people have kind of dug up the ancient trade route contracts and everything. They found that the caravan never used to go to Mecca because there was no Mecca on the map that people were aware of. Uh, most likely, the Meccans would join the caravan at a particular point. So that's most likely what used to happen. Um, so it's not um, yeah, the famous story of Abraha where he comes to Ta'if. But then he's, he says he hears of this other temple that people worship. Uh, so he wants to destroy it in the famous story of Abraha taking his elephant, but he doesn't know where it is. So mm. he says, where is this place? So one of the people allegedly trying to tell him um, is this person called Abu Rigal. Uh, 
who's still buried, uh, or they claim he's buried, or his location is at Ta'if. So he then tells them that, oh, well, Makkah is allegedly in that direction. Because they don't know, they've not heard of, and he is a huge king who's ruling the entire South Arabia. They've not heard of where, where is Makkah. But I, I don't think this is a conspiracy, the way some non-Muslims have claimed, that they claimed that Muslims made this whole thing up. I don't think that's true. But I think just naturally, the way things happen, that when Islam, uh, Islam kind of like um, erupted, there, there's an explosion of faith. And the, the kind of light that it brings with it, it eclipsed the history prior to it. So for almost one to 200 years, people really all became about Islam. Mm. And so people forgot a lot about what was happening one to 200 years before. Even if you think about it today, you know, if somebody was to ask you, well, what was going on 100 years before today where we are today? It's, you know, it's only... If we're left to our own imagination, we're going to come up with all kinds of things. And that's, I feel, I feel what happened in this case, that people later on tried to guess, oh, you know, maybe Makkah was this huge place because mm -hmm. now it's so important. And so yeah. What would you say um, Ummul Qura would mean then? Would it just mean like in the eyes of God because it's where his house is, would you say? That's why. No, that's actually a very good point. <laughs> if I knew you were going to come prepared, I wouldn't have started the topic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Ummul Qura is a, is a brilliant... Um, um, Brilliant question. I've got a very detailed video, by the way, just for people okay. who are uh, curious. Um, it's called A Reply to Dan Gibson yeah. on the Makkah question. So Ummul Qura, the reason it was called Ummul Qura, it was named Ummul Qura by Qusay, one of the ancestors of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who recaptures Makkah from, at that time, the tribes. Um, now he comes he had as a young child had gone to live in petra with his stepdad and he gets kind of very um you know gets a lot of maltreatment and he, he he's not you know he gets bullied and things like this and but then he grows up and he has this huge identity thing and he comes back to Mecca because that's where his origin is from. And when he does eventually, he, there's this struggle and he kind of with one of the high priests. And when he does remarry, uh, so, so he marries, I, I believe, the high priest's daughter and there's some power grab. And But once he does gain, uh, gain some control over Mecca, he refashions the Kaaba and the surrounding buildings and he makes them in a way that reflects especially the buildings reflect petra and this is why the kaaba is referred to even in sahil bukhari and these things as the kaaba shamia mm. it is referred to the kaaba of sham right. and this is where people like dan gibson are quite easily misled because they think, well, the kaaba of shamia must be in petra because petra was called ummul qura historically and they find that and they say, look, this is the Ummul Qur'an that the Qur'an is saying. But he fashions it where he had grown up or spent a certain amount of his time because Petra was this, you know, it was this thing in his time. So he calls it Ummul Qur'an, mm -hmm. naming it after Petra. And then this name kind of sticks. And he's the one who invites Quraysh to come and settle in, um, in Mecca. Yeah. So, and would you also say that um, this is quite a big thing that Ghamdi Saab propagates? He talks about established history. So he would mm. say that, for example, no one can argue that Muhammad Sallallahu didn't exist. It's simply impossible for such a thing to be fabricated by such a large number of people. Uh, he would say the Mughal Empire, you cannot, someone cannot say it did not exist, that someone just made it up. So would you say that this is also a kind of sort of historical uh, <laughs> right, I, I, okay. You see, there's two ways 
that one approaches such a topic. One is objectively and one is subjectively. So subjectively as Muslims, we can make these claims that, look, there is no doubt that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, existed and he was a messenger of God. As a Muslim... No, it, it would just be that he existed, not messenger of God, just that he existed. No, but I'm, I'm saying as a Muslim, we can make okay. these claims. Sure. As if we're speaking objectively, just as we just want to speak from an uh, historical perspective, the historicity of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I I don't feel we could say what we could say is that there is overwhelming or good enough evidence to suggest he existed. Uh, I don't feel we could claim that there is categorical certainty, because how would you claim categorical certainty? Um, there wouldn't be a way to claim it, except what you would do is one of the best ways is you would look at an inter, almost like, um, not an interdisciplinary, but um, uh, an inter-historic perspective. So you've got the Muslim's history, but you mm -hmm. have to remember Muslim history is written much after the Prophet. It's probably right. written 150 to 200 years after the Prophet. Right. Um, then you've got, from, from the Prophet's time, we're going to get some, um, even if we say hadith have been transmitted, but really even hadith documentation is like 200 years plus after the Prophet, almost. So you do have some non-Muslim um historians who live in the prophet's time and a few years after him they are writing about him they just they don't mention much about him but they mention that you know there's this this arab by the name of muhammad and they describe him as a warlord and that he's fighting and he's trying to take over our kingdoms and stuff now that goes to show that you know th well it's very unlikely they would be making it up as well now when you put a bunch of things together it's yeah. it's and you get different historians so you get some from the sassanid some from the uh, byzantine some from the muslims um it's good enough to show that the prophet muhammad existed yeah. so that's what i would argue i uh, to say certainty is uh, that's not how history would work because yeah. how would you claim certainty unless you had an actual something historic to so now what what did help a lot was the birmingham quran mm. that helped a lot actually in this course um because think, up and yeah uh, shazad salim he knows the woman who uh, found the birmingham manuscript and apparently she has some more manuscript that she's uh, trying to release as well soon or something so that would be interesting right so okay that's um i look forward to that there's uh the birmingham quran manuscript did or the folio did show that it, it puts the quran back to either the prophet's time or just after him within a decade or two which is how the muslims have claimed it because mm. we have claimed that it was written down most likely in uthman's time so it really matches with the history as Muslims had claimed. Mm. Because a lot of non-Muslim historians, not a lot, sorry, but certain non-Muslim historians had pushed towards, um, they had pushed towards the fact that Abdul Malik ibn Marwan had uh, invented the Prophet. So they feel that the oldest uh, inscriptions we have of the Prophet, which in Dome of the Rock and in other places and coins go back to Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So they so some people had argued that Abdul Malik ibn Marwan invented the Prophet Muhammad. Now, as other be as you know, other historians had challenged this theory and said that look, for Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, who's around 70 Hijri, to invent the Prophet, it would have been easier for the Prophet to have existed. Exactly. Then for him to have invented the prophet, it's like, because yeah, um, it's like the I'm not sure about the person's name, but the Sunni say that there was this one Jew who invented Shiism. It's like um, yeah, yeah, Abdullah ibn Sabah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's very um because if you think about it, like some Quranists, they argue that Salah is a is a Zoroastrian thing. It's it's very I find yeah. it kind of absurd that one some time in history 
Muslims are, you know, spread out everywhere. They're all mm -hmm. doing their own stuff. And then somehow they all just, some guy comes to them and says, oh, by the way, your prophet said pray five times a day. Yeah, and, and I feel that, you know, we have this triangulation perspective, uh, which is the, the split between Sunni, Shia and Ibadi Islam. Mm. Okay, this kind of Khariji Islam, which is, one could argue, a musiba in Islam. However, ironically, it today supports the validity of Islam. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as a it's it's shocking that in this niqma is a niqma there, you know, every, every cloud has a silver lining that this this triangular split of mainstream Islam is the very thing that points to the validity of Islam today, because it would have been impossible for Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan, who was from Bani Umayyah, to have not only shifted, because they feel they argue that Abd al-Malik and his son Walid are the ones who then Walid chose Mecca and invented this Mecca story and this whole thing. Now, it would have been impossible for them to conjure up this story of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the birth of Islam, get everybody to embrace Islam. And then convince the Shia who hate oh, them and convince the Ibadis who hate them and change the po point of Hajj because the Hajj would have, according to this theory, it would have mm -hmm. taken place in Petra, right, according right. to this theory. So to, to do this and get everyone on board, that, that's preposterous. And uh, another very interesting point is, you see, according to these theories uh, that try to challenge Islam, they're known as Islam revisionist theories. Mm -hmm. um, they argued that initially that the Quran was from the Abbasid era that the Qur'an emerges perhaps 150 to 200 years after the Prophet. Now, if that was the case, first of all, the, the Birmingham folio has disproven that. Um, but secondly, you see, if the Qur'an emerges after, let's say, after uh, the Shia and the Umayyad, Umayyad split, after mm. the Khawarij split, after the Bani Umayyah versus Bani Abbas, after the Byzantine quashing them and quashing the Sassanids and quashing all of this, it would, you know, with all this strife and schisms within Islam, the Khawarij have emerged, the Qadariya, the Jabariya, the, you know, all these different, it would have been impossible that the Quran would not have had some of this sectarian discourse in it or the political yeah. discourse. Oh, it would have yeah. definite, because think about it, if the Quran was being invented in the time of Bani Abbas or even yeah. Bani Umayyah, it would have naturally reflected some discourse to be against the Shia or to be against the Abbasids or the Umayyads or to, do, do you see what, because the person inventing it naturally, that's the flavor yeah. of the time. There would be an ayah like Wala to the Shia or something like or that. Or something, or it would have said something, it would exactly, or something like that. It would have shown, like we would see signs of these schisms. And the fact that the Quran has none of these, it strongly points to it predating the schisms. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very interesting point as well, in addition to the triangulation that they could never have got all of these groups to agree. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a miracle for us as Muslims and for Islam. But if, speaking historically, as, as almost in a scientific way, uh, th that has a different language. We can't say use words like certainty um, unless we have something very like here is I don't know, here is, you know, this is a particular thing of the prophet or this is that we have as a fact. Yeah. So we, I, so I would still line with saying good enough evidence. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ahmed, it's been epic. Did, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you remember, you did reply. Did you see the, the reface things I sent you, the AI? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> How do they make these? Yeah, <laughs> there's an app. There's there's two apps. The yeah. Is are they okay? Yeah. Well, okay. You have to send me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, right. I wanted to say one more thing, Mufti. That sure, of course. Uh, 
I, I remember watching one of your videos that you said that you learned how to read Devna. And uh, that kind of like got me motivated. And inshallah, I'm starting to learn Hebrew as well now. Wow, that's, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, that's, a, there's a yeah, scholar they... called Abdul Sattar Ghodi, and he wrote a book on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Torah. And uh, there's uh, there's many verses, and one of them is Wakulluhu Muhammadim. And uh, he argues about it's it's a very interesting book uh, if you can read it. I think it's very good. Muhammad yeah. in the I, I will. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, the more languages you can get under your belt, go for it. Wallahi, you will never regret it. It will only be an asset. Um, Devanagari, the the Hindi script. Uh, is something which I've I've learned and I need to practice it more. I tell you what really helps with practicing this stuff is to do things like follow meme pages and these kind of things mm. on social media sites yeah. and to follow things with that language. And so so sometimes like in Devanagari, you will get uh, poetry, people writing Urdu poetry, but they write it in Hindi. And if you're learning Hindi, then it kind of helps you. Um, also having it on your phone exactly for predictive yeah. text and stuff like this helps yeah. but uh, and and i suppose with devanagari it's um um it's very if you already know urdu it's basically you know the other it's another register just for the same language i think for you learning hebrew would be very easy because i'm learning arabic but you you obviously fluent in arabic i should i should learn hebrew then do you know what people are gonna say yeah you're a they're, they're gonna say yar israel ka agent hai, yar. <laughs> I'll, I'll fit the profile 100 percent then <laughs> because you know um there's um Obviously, um, the Zabur, they obviously they can't be corrupted. They're just praises of God. There's a there's a psalm. It says, "Hol Adonai ala khmaim. Can you guess what that means? Hol Adonai ala maim. Hol ad uh, Adonai. That say my Lord is no. Hol Adonai ala maim. Ala maim. It's the same as Arabic. It's the same words. Oh, the same word as in yeah. upon water or something. No. Exactly upon water. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's literally exactly the same. Wow. Okay. Adonai is usually the, their version of uh, like Ilahi or like yeah. Because uh, yeah. they don't say um, uh, they don't say Yahweh, so that's they, yeah. they change it into Adonai, which is interesting because as some have argued, is from Atonai. Mm. Atonai. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. You know, it's very it's very interesting because in the Bible it says that um. I, I will be who I will be, but in the Quran it just says Allahu fa'buduni. Yeah. So it's very interesting. I'll tell, tell you a fascinating point on that before we go. You know, to show that the Quran, you see, it's very interesting, a subtlety to show that it is the like it appears to the Prophet وسلم, in its essence. And it, when Allah is quoting things in there or, or re revealing quotations, they are not, they can be that kind of meaning, if you like. Is this verse when Allah says that, say, uh, I am Allah? Now, in two different places, it's slightly different, mm -hmm. which goes to show that Allah couldn't have said both simultaneously even though it's a subtle difference mm -hmm. but when he's saying it to musa السلام, that so it just goes to show that this um the revelatory process but it's a, yeah. that's an interesting there's, side there's point. loads of stuff like that like some maki quran will be very similar to madani quran the same word it's very interesting yeah well ahmed i'll leave okay. you to it man okay. Gio, ya, Gio. Thank you so much. Salamu alaikum. Take care, man. Salamu alaikum. People, that, as I've mentioned, is uh, the young Ramadi Saab. <laughs> Our very own, UK's own. Uh, <laughs> right, so, and, and I'm really impressed with Ahmed, honestly. He brings hope. Um from the perspective that such a young person, such a passionate, keen interest in Islam and its intellectual legacy, not just, we're not just talking about, um, you know, I'm not just talking about just uh, 
worshipping and doing things, but actual a passion to learn and to absorb the entire legacy. Wow. Right. Who do we have here, people? Fahim Ali. All right. People, I can't see the other webcams. Let me. All right. Fahim Ali. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, salam. Steve. All right. Where are you joining us from, Fahim? Uh, the U oh, uh, Sitcup, if you know what that is. Sitcup? Yeah. Sitcup? What's it? Yeah, it's around uh, <laughs> Bex Bexley Heath. Lexley Heath? London, basically. Yeah. Oh, London. Yeah. London, bruv. London. All right. You're doing it. You're doing it. See us Midlanders. What would we know about Lexley Heath? And <laughs> so, all right, Fahim, man. What's going on? Are you, do you study? Is it, are you a student or what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a student. Yeah. All I right. Think I so, with you last year, I think. Allahu Akbar. It was, it was about veganism. I think you remember. Right. Yes, I do now. Look at that. Yeah. All right. So, how's it going? How? What would you like to share with us? Or what would you like to say, Fahim? Um, I wanted to ask about your thoughts on atheism, if you've ever heard what? of that. Atheism. No, atheism. Ig theism. Ig theism. Yeah. Okay. No, no. In enlighten us. What's ig theism? It's the idea that since God is incoherent, we can't really believe in him. Hmm. Okay. That um when we say God exists beyond space and time, that doesn't really have that much meaning to us because we can't comprehend of anything that exists beyond space and time. Existence to us is space and time, basically. So mm. what does it mean to say that God exists beyond space and time? Right, interesting. <clears throat> I would agree that we can't comprehend um, non-space. And, I mean, we can somewhat assume to imagine no time. But really, what we're, <laughs> uh, I suppose, imagining, I, I, I think we can maybe somewhat of an atemporal reality we can imagine, um, a timelessness, because we've all at some point felt as though time is not moving, even though it is, but we felt that. But I agree, we can, we are incapable um, of imagining spacelessness this uh, and and it was uh, immanuel kant that says that we you know we that we are trapped within space and time especially space and even if we try to picture space out there we picture it inside another space <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know we we're, we're kind of uh, just um, it, we're stuck with that one, but that doesn't, w w why would that negate, um, why do you feel that negates God? Be because it's like, or in this, sorry, not you, but why do you feel that this argument argues to negate God just because of that principle? Because how can you believe in something that you don't really understand? It's like, uh, it's like Christians with the Trinity kind of. Um, with one and three, and you can't really make sense of it. So you know, that can't really be how God exists, is what I would say. Look at that. See, Fahim just went deep, real deep. You're doing it, Fahim. <laughs> you see, and the irony here is Fahim means the one of understanding. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Because so, let me get this right. Because, um, bec because we um, we can't grasp something. You know, yeah, you do, and it you do, and it. Everyone like and subscribe, people like and subscribe. Um, because we can't grasp something, therefore it does not exist. But that's not true. Um, we I would say, therefore, it's. Um... So truth has to have meaning to us, right? Like, if it doesn't have meaning, then we can't say something is true. So to say God exists is a meaningless claim, essentially. No, but consciousness exists. Yeah, sure. 
how, how how do we know what how do we know consciousness exists oh you can ex we're experiencing it right now yeah but this could be but we don't know the um veritability of what we're experiencing with is an assumption like this could all be a dream this could all yeah. be an illusion this could all be that we all came into existence right now with pre-programmed memories of all this having happened um the, just because i'm conscious or i could be assuming you're conscious but you could just be reacting how creatures react in a particular way so how, how do we know consciousness actually exists we, um, we don't know but and it we don't even understand interest. consciousness. Yeah, we don't understand it yet, but I think we can understand it, but just we haven't been able to understand it yet. So, but, but that defeats the very argument in saying, well, God, because we can't understand him, he doesn't have meaning. In fact, arguably, God provides, you know, one of the most powerful meanings for most people across the globe. Most people uh, across the globe uh, derive um, incredible meaning and you know value to their lives because of God <coughs> I think to say well of course we can't prove God exists um, and to say that because we can't envisage God I mean we can't even envisage dark matter or dark energy we, we, we don't even you know we can't even understand these things within physics um, I just because we can't envisage or or accurately conceptualize something because of its enigmatic characteristics um, does not mean that that doesn't exist or it has to be invalid. It could just be that we don't have a good understanding. Okay, but if you say God exists, exists is like an action, right? To yeah. exist, it's it's a verb. Look you at that! I I delivered know, food to your house before. You do, and it's Said. <laughs> so right. when when God does things, like if He creates something or if He does something else, those are all actions that you do within time. So mm. how can He, you know, how can He do any actions but be outside of time? You see. <clears throat> If something exists within a fourth dimension, yeah, as right. physicists have explained, which w most likely that it does, anything that w exists within a fourth dimension, w we would, no matter where or how we are, never be able to escape it. It would be everywhere for us, as in we couldn't, because we only live in a three-dimensional world. So uh, a two-dimensional world, you see, we, it, it, by just placing my finger on, on that world, all that world would see is a circle. Yeah, not even yeah. a circle, sorry, a line. It would just see, a, in fact, it would just see that as a like a kind of flat line almost because it doesn't have depth and it doesn't have um but we would it it could not escape us no matter how how that world is similarly anything that exists within four dimension or in the fourth dimension we are we cannot escape it now even just looking at the theories that we have in physics today you know, whether we're looking at M theory or the other theories, we are explaining the dimensions of this universe to be any on average, what's, what holds mathematically is there are 10 dimensions or 11, arguably. Now, that, that doesn't even make sense to us. Like we can't even, we can't even picture what that even means. <laughs> but it doesn't make it any less real because the mathematics hold up. So they show that this does. What I'm saying is that, look, there are depths and complexities that people may not understand. Like, let's 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 dumb it down. Not for you, but I'm just saying for the discourse. You're incredibly uh, just these questions reflect, you know, the depth of, of your uh, intelligence. 
let's say now you've got um, hunter gatherers, the Kalahari Bushmen. Okay, um, now you are trying to explain to them coding and software and you're trying to explain to them that everything is a one and a zero that right now this this live stream is just ones and zeros now th they would definitely laugh their heads off at you <laughs> quite rightly so because in their world what you're saying in how they can understand it because come on let's be real even to you and me that sounds absurd to a to a reasonable level it sounds you know, the everything, what we're, me seeing you right now, it's just ones and zeros. You know, th this doesn't make any sense. But yet, at a greater complexity to people, to engineers and software engineers and people in tech, it will make sense. But they are, para you know, they are almost universes away from that understanding. It doesn't make either one any less real because in their world as well, that what they're saying kind of makes sense that what, what do you mean ones and zeros? What the hell is ones and zeros? So they are also kind of right, but these people are not wrong. And this is just our world. You know, and yet we haven't even got to how the universe works and how is the universe a hologram? Is it a simulation? Um, you know, is it somebody sent me this uh, video, uh, a documentary? I'm going to try and get him on a mind trap. It's a producer and it's called um, it's a YouTube documentary called Dunya, a simulation odyssey. And he was trying to argue using Islamic uh, motifs like the Loh al Mahfuz to be something from which the simulation is projected. Um, that's what I understood so far. I mean, I, I'll have to, you know, pay more, properly go through it. But um, so the, the the current theory is that this simulation, uh, the let's say let's say the universe be a simulation. Now, and many physicists, astrophysicists have argued that the mathematics do seem to show that it it seems to incline that way, that it's some kind of a simulation. It doesn't make it any less real, by the way. It makes it very still just as much real for me and you and I. But if it be a simulation, they feel that the 3D would come from something 2D. And there's, there's these kind of theories. Now, um, he was arguing that the Loh al mahfuz is that kind of thing from which this whole um, existence emanates or comes into existence. But that's, um, I mean, I'm just putting it out there as a theory, as a, well, uh, um, what I'm trying to say is just because we don't understand something um, does not equate to its absurdity even though its absurdity may resonate with a lot of people, just as the Kalahari Bushmen explaining to them that all these things that just, you know, all this software and these different th things that we're seeing are just based on ones and zeros is laughable. And they would all get together and laugh at you and me and everyone, but it doesn't make it any less real. So, yeah. Hmm. So, <laughs> Did I just answer that? <laughs> what's, what's, <laughs> um, know, so what's the um what's the diff so how's it different from someone using those same explanations to say, well God could be three and one and we just don't understand it? Like I don't see how that's any different. God could be three and one, one, just the Trinity. No. <clears throat> right, okay. Um I don't know about the three and one in the sense that, you see, th this is a reasoned claim, isn't it? If one was to argue that God could be everything, I think that would hold more reason uh, with it as opposed to saying God is just this one. God became this person just to get killed. for to, Because, you see, the thing about Christianity that doesn't make any sense whatsoever is that the bedrock of Christianity is redemption, okay, that Jesus 
that God Almighty, he, it's not, you see, it's not just the incarn, the, I suppose to them, it's not incarnation. It's a kind of uh, an association of God is within Jesus Christ kind of dwelling. Now, it's not that that is so philosophically twisted because many philosophies have held that, you know, the ancient Greeks and other people, and many people have had this understanding of God's dwelling amongst humans. It's more so, you see, in Christianity, the, the bedrock is redemption, that Jesus, this whole action takes place so God may sacrifice himself and be tortured. But then the question is, tortured for what? Tortured for the sins of mankind. Now, you see, now that sounds, uh, I mean, th that part is even somewhat understandable, as in, uh, what I'm trying to say is if you romanticize it, you can accept it as a as a story. If it was to happen at the end, <laughs> you know, like of a story, like let's say here's a story. All these people have done horrible things. And, you know, as a as, this is a narrative, this is a uh, an archetype of sacrifice that the the lead character comes and sacrifices himself for the re remaining people, as often is the case in many stories. The problem here is God has already done this 2,000 years ago, and now what? You know, so so what is <laughs> what was the what was the point of all of that? So the point of it is so everybody's forgiven, but what they're forgiven for every so let me get this right. So Hitler, despite doing whatever he did, he just had to say, "Well, I accept Jesus Christ," and that's it. He's forgiven. It doesn't, you see. It's the incoherence of the entire narrative, which it's built on, this redemption. It's not built on just God dwelling amongst humans. It's why did God dwell amongst humans in order to redeem himself, redeem humans by killing himself or having himself killed, uh, which is the absurd claim. So, yeah. Mm. But I'm, I'm referring more to the idea that uh, God is the Son, He's the Father and the Holy Spirit, but the Father isn't the Son, the Son isn't the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit isn't the Father. Like, that doesn't make sense to us, which is why we don't believe in it, right? Or is it some other reason? Right, true, that, that too. But, but you're missing the point that when Christians say this, they say this for a reason. They don't just say it because... It just sounds good. They say it because God has to then redeem mankind by offering himself. That's the reason he's born, you know, through Mary as Jesus. It's to sacrifice himself at the altar, uh, at the altar for mankind. So that is... The, it is the, 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 the absolute absurdity of that. In addition to, yes... You see, if you say, well, does God delve into creation? Now, it does, it's from a philosophical perspective, we would argue against it. Christians would argue for it. Uh, we would ov obviously argue that God, um, you know, to, to render himself incapable and subject to human flaws and frailties and uh and just the, the 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 workings of creation is irrational to us uh, because God is you know the greatest that there ever is and in all his majesty why would how why and how would he do that to us it doesn't make any sense but to Christians and to other people they may argue that that is not the greatest problem they may say well God you know what what's the problem if he did um, so I, th I think if you're asking, is it absurd? Yes, from our perspective, we would argue it's absurd. Could somebody argue on the other side? I think they could, using philosophy, argue from the other perspective as well. I don't think it, it's a stronger argument, but I think they could still argue it that, well, no, God, you know, he just, he just did. He just did. You know, it's just like, well, he did, and what? <laughs> you know, it's, well, I guess... OK, you know, it, it's it's an argument. It's not I'm not saying it's it makes it convincing, but it, it is an argument.
So would you not say that existence beyond space and time is absurd? Existence? Yeah. Beyond space and time is absurd. No? Why? So how do you define existence? You see, obviously, <laughs> if you say existence beyond space and time is absurd, right, this question would come down to, because any known example I can only give would be rationally within space and time, because yeah. that's the only known objects that we have. However, I did mention to you consciousness. But and it's within you, space and time, isn't it? How, how do you know that? We're experiencing it. You're experiencing no, just, space no, and just time. because you're experiencing something does not mean that that is it's caught within this dimension. How do you know you're not just the same thing? Just because you're experiencing that finger, it does not mean that what's at the back of that is part of this world. So like, how, how would you how would you definitively state that consciousness is within this dimension or within just because we experience it, but we could be experiencing it from our perspective. If it's a hyperstructure, then we wouldn't know it's hyper meta reality. We would only know the reality that we brush against. But it would be in some dimension, right? But I mean, we don't know. We don't know anything. Right now, we don't even know where to begin with consciousness. So we can't start anything about it because where is it? How is it? What is it? <laughs> is it out there? Is it in here? Is it in the quantum realm? Is it something else? Is it? We just don't know. The physicists don't even know where to begin with it. So it's. But just because we have some experience of it, does not mean that it is within our realm. But it's in some realm. Or our experience of it could be within that realm. So let's say, so for example, uh, if we're catching a mirror of something, we, we just because we're catching the mirror image of something doesn't mean it's in the mirror or it's in where we are witnessing it. Me seeing you right here in front of me, you're obviously not in front of me. But I'm somewhere. That's an assumption. You could be just AI artificially generated. Well, it'd for, still be for somewhere, all... No, but that, I mean, you, you, there would be no I. <laughs> you, you, this whole thing could just be an artificial kind of generation. So but what the, I'm saying... The AI would still be somewhere. Right. Okay. The AI, but that's not you, though. Yeah, but then I either I exist or I don't, right? Right. Of course. So if I'm, if I exist, I would be somewhere. You see, the problem is I'm... that you. Uh, you see, the problem is when you're saying exist, you're yep. you're characterizing existence by only things which are known in existence. Well, now how, by that very you, definition, you know? it is. By that very definition, it is trapped. No, because philosophically, there it is a valid philosophical question that could entities exist outside of this universe, outside of space and time. This is a valid question, philosophically but, speaking. But when you say outside, that's an, uh, you know that's a description of space, like you exist. True, because language is restrictive and reductive. Yeah. So for me to get, use an example, I have to use words that are reductive. So that's just that's that that's unfortunately the frailty of language. But you get what I'm trying to say when I say outside of. Now you say now I understand that you're saying well outside within language means it's a space narrative. That is true. However, we are using this in a philosophical thought experiment in saying that could something exist outside of space and time as in independent of if i was to use that word now philosophically speaking why not just because but, we can't envisage it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make it so but what what is it what does it mean to say that then to what, to, what, to be independent what, is dark, of... what does dark matter mean you could look it up. 
No, but this this is what I mean. You see, just because we don't understand something, it doesn't make it any less reasonable to be. And so it's not necessarily about whether we understand it right now. It's about okay. whether it's understandable at all in general. Sure. But then is that not the very nature of uh, let's take quantum physics, the unpredictability of quantum physics is an inherent aspect of its reality. It's not that we don't have the knowledge. It is the actual entity, the, the, the unpredictability of its reality, like how it operates. It, there is an inherent element of unpredictability in it. That's not a lack of understanding. That is our, our total understanding of it. So, you see, which completely breaks our understanding of general logic, that can something be in one place and another place simultaneously, can it? Yeah. Exactly. That's bizarre and absurd, isn't it? But yeah. it's true, just because we now know it to be. But had of you asked this question 100 years ago, it would have been absurd. Existence, as you mentioned, is space-time, uh, restrictive. So to exist, for this phone to exist, it exists in this geocentric space. Now, in, in the quantum world, it doesn't behave like that. One thing can exist simultaneously at two different places but at the still, very same time. They're still both in space and time, though. No, simultaneously, which is an absurdity. It's an absurdity, but it's still... Which is inconceivable. Can you even conceive that? What them both being at the same space simultaneously in the same time yeah i can think of it exactly but it's inconceivable for within our world within i don't mean look obviously as a photograph you can picture like in a movie i can picture here's the same picture here and here but as far as the real world is concerned this cannot exist simultaneously one you cannot be in the exact same moment in two different places you the very same you experiencing two different places simultaneously it just cannot happen yet in the quantum world it does happen all the time so your very notion of existence is defied because existence according to your definition is tied down into space-time it's restricted. Yeah, but you can so, exist in, you can still exist no, but that's, in two places. No, but not, not in that very space time. See, space time it, being one, in that very space time, you cannot exist in multiple. Let's say this, let's say this is a checkered board and this is A1, B1, C1. Now, for you to exist, you have to exist in one of these. Existence cannot happen multiply in, uh, in different ones simultaneously because space time is bound. You understand? It does not, that's not how physics works. I know quantum physics works like that, but not physics in the world as we know it or philosophically know it. So the very definition when you're saying existence has been defied by modern science. I would, I would say existence is space-time <laughs> but i've just explained that yeah. that's defined so okay so time yeah, that's still okay so let's within. okay okay let's take that then so time how, uh, how do you know time exists well time is a part of existence i would say how do you know that that's that's how i'm defining it no but how how would you know because you see, for time to exist, you could say I'm experiencing it, but does time actually exist? Yeah, but what do you mean by exist? You tell me. You, you're the <laughs> saying you're saying time exists. Does no, I'm it? saying time is a part of existence. So it exists. Well, you don't say. Do you say existence exists? <laughs> so 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 wait a minute so does time exist or no it's a simple question i i think it's uh it doesn't really make sense as a question it does it makes absolute sense i can ask anyone does time exist yeah but it's a very if, rational question if you define it in the way look, that i am okay does space exist 
Well, I would, I, again, I would just say space and time are existence. So time does exist. So, but if by asking does time or space exist, it's the same as asking does existence no, exist? No, no, because space, no, no, it isn't. It isn't at all. It isn't at all because existence is a descriptive factor. Okay, to describe so an entity. You... Now, time, this is what I'm saying. Does time actually exist? You can't actually prove time exists. How would you prove time exists? How would you prove anything? No. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Well, you could weigh things by weighing them. You could size them by checking out scales and measurements. I mean, there's many ways to prove things. I'm asking time, when you say as an actual entity, as an actual ent because is time simply the measurement of motion? Is it the measurement of mass moving? Is it what, from a physics perspective, I know I, I, I've used space time by uh, stated by Einstein, but now with quantum physics and quantum gravity and all these questions that have arisen, uh, this has been problematized, hasn't it? So now the understanding is, well, time most likely does not exist. And even though Einstein himself did argue that from some perspective, saying the past, present and future are just an illusion, albeit a persistent one, as Einstein said. Now, you see, does time exist? The only law within physics to argue against that, second law of thermodynamics, entropy, is perhaps the only law in physics that shows somewhat of an inclination called at times, time's arrow. But even that has been argued against that does it actually show time you see just because you're perceiving something doesn't make it real it just makes it subjectively real and there's an inter subjectivity we know that time slows down the closer you are towards some gravitational thing we know time is relative you know time is relative so for it to be relative it could not have uh, an objective existence you understand? Because it's a subjective reality. We're just experiencing it. It doesn't make it objectively like the noumenal realm and the phenomenal realm. It doesn't make it necessarily there in existence, so as to speak. I think that, but you see, to sum this up, there's the questions are good questions, but you realize that they actually, you see, once you start to unpack them, you realize they kind of set up in a particular way. So when people say, oh, does this exist? What they, does God exist? And by existence, I mean, show me something like I can pick up this glass. Then obviously you can't do that. Uh, and then when they move on to know, but God has to exist beyond time and space. But then does time exist? Does consciousness exist? Does... Uh, so these questions and then even the very logics by which they're basing these things on, let's say we're basing it on logic that something must exist within time and space. But that same logic that defines that teaches you that something can only preoccupy one time and space at any given time and space. But yet quantum physics defies that. So what we're seeing today, we are truly in a Socratic age where... You see, we are coming to know that we th that what we actually that we actually don't know a lot of things. Uh, but I I do I admire the question for him. It's epic, yar. Kya baat hai, yar? At this time, this ungodly hour. <laughs> right. Um, so it's been. I epic. have a. Uh, I have a quantum have physics. I have a quantum physics exam in a few weeks. So. No way, yar. You're doing it. You're doing it. Salute you, yar. Salute you. Yeah. That's it, man. Take care. Best of luck with the with the exam. And the best thing is don't even turn up. Just say uh, I was somewhere else at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, man. Take care. Much love. Right. You know the the famous thing with um, what was it with uh, was it with quantum physics or was it with I'm pretty sure was it was it Feynman and but there's the um, or was it just generally physics? <laughs> where the, the 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 famous discussion where he gave out the same exam papers and he was asked that these are his they said but these are the same questions as last year he said i know but the answers have changed <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's quantum physics in a nutshell. Yeah. It's just changing. Yeah. Take care, man, Fahim. Yeah. Much love. Stay blessed, right. man. Bye. Assalamu alaikum. People, what a thoroughly deep and interesting conversation. Wow. People are really on it, man. <laughs> ah, right. So what is going on? People, Lucy Wine Jones. Ah, assalamu alaikum, Lucy. Ahlan wa sahlan. Wa alaikum as salam I'm. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Where are you joining us from, Lucy? I'm joining from Hampshire. Hampshire. All right. The UK. You do. We need quite a few people from the UK today. <laughs> All right. I guess I'm a bit of a vampire this Ramadan staying up. All, <laughs> All right. <night>. Mashallah. <laughs> So talk to us, Lucy, share your thoughts, or is there a question? Oh, I, I know, like, um, I, I know, like, I've got quite an interesting story to share, like. Yeah, sure, go I know, it. like, yeah, I'm just trying to dig up my books and stuff. Um, I'm trying to find a book. Yeah, I might need to go on the bookshelf back there, or uh, I can quote on the top of my head, but I've been doing some research into some Irish genealogies and stuff. Okay. Irish and, genealogy. Hmm. Yeah. And I know, like, I know, like, according to the Gaelic texts, the the Irish high kings of old, or Gaelic high kings of old, that you can use the term Gaelic and Irish synonymously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they descended from the believer from the family of Pharaoh. Okay. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know, okay. like I, I know, like I, yeah, and and yeah, I've been doing research into it and stuff, and I know that in order to prove true and stuff, it would require a DNA test on ancient Egyptian pharaohs. Haven't they done some recently with the, um, you know, as they dug up because there was the whole new dig uh, at. Um, you know, with uh, uh, at the at the site of uh, Sakara, uh, Sakara at the site of Sakara, and I thought they'd done quite a few uh, sample testing from there. I'm not. That's what mm. I'd, I'd watched a bit of. Yeah, well, I know, like the I know, like it would specifically require the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, like just random members of the Egyptian mm. public may not be a, may not be the right kind of sample we're looking for because it would require because the believer from the family of Pharaoh addresses the addresses Pharaoh and his people as yeah call me mm. you may have power in this world but what power do you have should Allah's punishment come to us? Wow. Um, okay. And the word yeah call me to quote Sheikh Hamza Yusuf means Per group of people with a common patrilineage. Yeah. Hmm. Is it so? Okay. Is, is this an area of uh, general research and interest that you're? you're I'm into, not the doing whole it formally with the Pharaohs? university. I, I'm not doing it formally with the university or anything. I'm just doing it as a but kind personal, of, but personal interest. Yeah. Yeah, personal interest, and also I know that when I've when I've uh, yeah and I know that there could be implications to this research because I am I am hoping that if if it's proven true that the Irish high kings of old have a common patrilineage with ancient Egyptian pharaohs that I'm hoping that it could mean that it would mean that the Irish essentially have followers of Musa al who are who are um who oh sorry my brain sorry, the yeah. question is welsh derived from gaelic uh, no just, uh, <laughs> um they're related languages but they're not they're not derived from each other and the welsh and or the welsh aristocracy and the gaelic aristocracy were two separate groups so the people from the believer of the family of pharaoh were were different than the welsh royals of old but mm. there are there have been found i know that the particular haplo group or male y chromosomal common patrilineage group it, our rm222 is the y chromosome of the irish high kings and this has been see, detected okay. because they practice serial polygamy mm. okay it's it's what's the haplo group r RM two 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 three twos. Okay. Mm. So it doesn't break off from the the R one. 
and it just it's one general, of it's it's an R one, one of the B derivatives. Haplogroup. It's an R one B haplogroup. group. Okay, so it which is, is Indo European in essence. Uh, I know that the... Tutankhamun, his DNA was tested, and his haplogroup is R one B. Okay, that's odd. R one B isn't that Indo European? Okay, yeah, according to the Gaelic texts, it said that before they were in Egypt, they were in Scythia, which would have been the countries of Kazakhstan to to Uzbekistan area. And they migrated probably because, like, horses came from that part of the mm. world, Central Asia. Central they probably Asia. migrated through horses down Who's there. They? And who, who, who are we speaking about when oh, we the, think they? Oh, the Scythian ancestors of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs and the believer from the family pharaoh. Oh, do, do you feel the pharaohs were, in essence, um, from, like, the these Russian steppes and the, the Central Asian steppes and... And mm. they they are the the lineage is is descending from from them. I know, like the R one B haplogroup originates from Kazakhstan area. Yeah, the R one. Yeah, that is the Indo European. But are, the pharaohs were no. The pharaohs. What did it did it come out as R one? <laughs> Seriously. Uh -huh. Well, there were probably. I know, like the. I know, like it says in the Gaelic texts that they met with the the native Egyptians. So there were there, Egypt was probably a diverse place even yeah in in ancient times before the Israelites migrated to Egypt. Hmm. Mm hmm. And I know that the R one B haplogroup, group. It's it, I, I I know that even though you may think that Gaelic people are Indo European and stuff. The Gaelic grammar and also Welsh grammar. My yeah. my surname is a Welsh surname. Uh, those, win, win those, their grammar is similar to Arabic and Hebrew. And is it? Yeah, it Gaelic. is. It's been, okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I I think that I yeah I, yeah so I I yeah there's probably a lot of areas to research into and the Welsh word for I e is uh, is the same as it is in arabic so the genitive for i okay so there's a lot of the the inflection uh impact the effect on accusative genitive and, and stuff like that on words yeah like for for example in arabic in english we say good morning in welsh it's bora da the bora means morning and the and the da means good so when we describe something like card Hey, that means monkey good, but it, but it literally means good monkey. Good. <laughs> <Okay. Ooh. laughs> All right. That's uh, that's quite interesting. Okay, that's uh, hmm. because I I am very uh, interested in how the, the whole just from a linguistic perspective how from a language and also from an anthropological perspective, but especially languages and how they kind of disseminated coming from an origin, um, because it kind of shows almost how migration spread out and, or maybe not, maybe people picked up languages because that's a, a, a another point, I suppose, when you're looking at, um, let's say Central Asia being the origin of uh, these people spoke, let's say, Pi, Proto Indo European, and then they spread out, or whether they come down and influence the pastoralists of, I don't know, the Iran kind of region, the Aryans, and, and they go off that way further east towards India, and, and some go west. And it's just fascinating because when you look at how uh, there's a great book on it, that The Wheel, the Horse, and um, I'm not sure. Have you come across it? I I, I get what you're talking about because the it was the Indo Europeans who invented the wheel. Yeah, and and that's where that's where it originates. That's where it originates from. And there's I know that there's that's it. It's I, called the Horse, the Wheel, and Language by David Anthony. So and it's I something like I went through. Languages like Sanskrit and Urdu yeah. and Hindi and Persian and English and Latin. Of which you get the descendants of Latin, French, German, and Spanish. No, not French. 
German, uh, sorry, French yeah. and Spanish. Yes, yeah, sorry, my, my brain. Oh. No, I yeah, mean, it's uh, fascinating because I suppose it's more, you see, through genetics now, we can see how the diaspora of of these haplogroups and genes, how they kind of spread out, which is just so fascinating mapping that. Um, but through language, yeah. it's very difficult because, you know, we can't really tell what happened when we just have to guess. <laughs> yeah, I know like with, I know like Arabic and Hebrew and Berber, they belong to the, and Akkadian and ancient Egyptian, they belong yeah. to the Afro-Asiatic family of which Semitic, Arabic and Hebrew is a branch. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, the, the So th that would be the whole Semitic. I mean, so you wouldn't put, um, hmm, I'm surprised that, uh, how accurate is this Tutankhamun's genetic reading? Is it is it very accurate? Or, because I'm really it, surprised too. I read it off, uh, off a website, well, off a few websites, so off a few sources and off a DNA company, but I don't know. I know like, yeah, I know like besides that, I know like that's just one result, but I know that it doesn't match up with the RM222 haplogroup. Hmm. I'm just reading it here. It's saying that in one result, saying that the haplogroup R1B1, um, but hmm. But it's saying yeah. that this is below one percent in modern day Egyptians. Is that I know like modern I know like people reckon that's because uh, Egypt has had a lot of migrations over the time. Like uh, there's been I, I've got a book about ancient Egypt somewhere, just mm. just looking around, but I've read a book about ancient Egypt. Oh, here it is. This is quite a famous book for anybody involved with the ancient Egypt and stuff, but Egypt's been occupied and colonized and well not colonized but lo there's been loads of mass migrations of people from different ethnic groups coming into Egypt over the period of time. Hmm. So there's been there's been black Africans, Greeks, Romans and yeah, Persians, the Libyans, there's been all, all sorts of group ethnic groups and stuff migrating to Egypt. So this is this is the specific book, The Rise and Fall of Ancient Egypt, Toby, Toby Wilkinson. Okay, let me just write. Okay, hmm, fascinating. So, so that that's that's the explanation as to why it's only like made up one percent of the modern day Egyptian population, and also the I know like the, I know like the new there were Nubian pharaohs of ancient Egypt who came yeah. from mm. North Sudan area. They were forcefully converted at one point to the ancient Egyptian religion, and then they then they event they eventually ended up ta taking over Egypt and becoming the pharaohs of Egypt. So I know, like the uh, the haplogroup of Tutankhamun and possibly Ramses II. Not that that's been disclosed to the public what his haplogroup is. The, their hapla, the haplogroups of Tutankhamun and Ramesses the third, who was the pharaoh of another dynasty, Ramesses the third is an E E Y E Y chromosome or haplogroup. You see, what what is he? E Y. No, not mm. E Y. E E something. A member of the E, e haplogroup. I don't remember the full full detail mm. of the Y chromosome of his Y Ramesses the third's Y chromosome, but. I know that as it's reckoned that Ramesses II is the pharaoh of the Exodus, Allah and we don't we don't know precise. Well, I don't know precisely who who exactly could be the pharaoh of the Exodus, but if it's proven that Ramesses II and maybe a few other pharaohs of that dynasty and I and the Irish High Kings of old have a common paternal ancestor, that I'm I'm thinking it probably could have political implications because it I know like interestingly enough if well the the reasons it could have political implications are because the if if it's proven true that the Irish have an ancestor who believed in Musa al Islam at the time of Musa al Islam Moses peace be upon him mm -hmm. it would it would mean that they essentially have a typical Jewish ancestry and I watched a video by a Jewish rabbi his name's Manus Friedman 
and he, he said that when the, the, the Bible says that there were, there were ancient Egyptians that left with the Israelites. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I'm just bringing up my notes, and as that, I haven't that, memorized these Bible verses off the top of my head, no, it is very. I'm, I'm I am very intrigued with the whole, um, especially. Uh, I mean, Egyptology, especially the the ph pharaonic uh, kind of phase, and especially the origin, the kingdoms, the the whole thing. Um, I find it incredibly fascinating. I have kind of inclined towards the understanding that perhaps um, Akhenaten may have been Moses, um, that there's that that view. So uh, that, that kind of adds a lot more <laughs> spice into it. Um, and there's, there's also an understanding that uh, a view, a theory that puts a lot of the chronological order on its head, but that assumes that Amenhotep was Sole Soleiman. Um, and, and that really, uh, I, I tell you what, I've got two videos uh, on YouTube. When, when yeah, you get a I chance, watched, have you, have you watched, watched those? Okay, yeah. oh, you have. <laughs> okay, because uh, it shows some, uh, it shows that theory. I, I do find it quite interesting. Um, yeah, and the, the rabbi specifically said that it was the ancient Egyptian. He said that the, I know like this is Israeliats and mm -hmm. Muslims take Israeliats with a pinch of salt or they're just viewed as any other historical record. And yeah, they, he said that the ancient, it was the ancient Egyptian magicians that had converted to Musa Islam's religion. They fled with the children of Israel. But then he mm -hmm. says that, the rabbi says that oh the the magicians they got involved with the golden calf worshipped whereas that is that is debunked in in the Quran where Musa alayhi salam addresses the children of Israel for worshiping the golden calf. Yeah, I mean in the uh, I suppose the biblical version is uh, it's Harun uh, alayhi salam doing it in 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 the in the Jewish Bible. Isn't it mm -hmm. obviously the Quran uh, refutes that and mentions this Samiri, whoever the Samiri is, um, but not Harun. But the the Jewish Bible see, uh, states that it's Harun who kind of uh, Aaron who gets into and sets up the golden calf and stuff. But the golden calf, I mean, there you see the theories or the the. I don't know the the histories associated with Moses um, are that according to some narrations, I mean the popular version is what we have generally that he takes the Israelites and goes off. Um, but other versions, there's versions that he sets up a kingdom in Egypt and rules there for a while. There's a version that he heads down to, um, I suppose, modern day Ethiopia or those kind of regions. There's there's different versions of what happens to Moses when this kind of um, clash or something, whatever it is, takes place in history. Obviously, not all as popular as each other. Um, but it is, uh, it's it's definitely very fascinating. I find it very, was it, is it, is it, it so it's, your, your interest is mainly foc focused and focalized on uh, the Egyptian link to the Gaelic to show a historicity of maybe the Israelites who left alongside Moses. Yeah, and also mm. I know like the I know like I know like the I know like the term in Hebrew is I'm I'm reading it from from my phone at the moment is vai garek meaning and the foreigners. So it would be garek. Mm -hmm. So that which would refer to the ancient Egyptian Jews, and there is instances in the in the Bible, like in the in the in what what we what the Jews called the Torah, of like Bithia, who she said was the daughter of Pharaoh, married Caleb, who was the ancestor of the Davidic kings. Mm. Okay. Uh, and they also, and also, there's an instance in Leviticus. I believe it's twenty Leviticus twenty four, mm -hmm. whereby there's a blasphemer who has an Egyptian dad but an Israelite mom, and they get punished under the law and are considered are considered under the law, as in under the okay. Torah, and mm -hmm. they get punished for for committing an offence. Okay. So that that is evidence right there of 
them having Jewish ancestry or stuff, or being considered Jews in the sense that they accepted the covenant and stuff. But the Jewish sources say that oh, um, he, oh, Shalom, the the that their ancestor, their Egyptian ancestor, was not a didn't follow Musa al Islam's religion. Hmm. But I I would dispute that. But I I believe that there are there is evidence from the Bible. My my claim and the. Gaelic texts also do talk of the um, the ancestor of the Gaelic people. It had, his his son, the believer from the family of Pharaoh's son, received a snake bite while while he was out, mount, out at Mount Sinai area with the Israelites, and okay. hmm, and he brings he brings the child to Musa al Islam, and Musa al Islam says that he will live in a land which is. Not op- which is not occupied by snakes, and I know that that's commonly interpreted to mean Ireland because it's it's believed that Ireland is has no snakes. But I I believe in Allah Allah Alam that it could be it could have just been a prophecy that they would go with the children of Israel to does does Ireland not have any snakes? I don't know. I've never <laughs> I've never been to verify or falsify. <laughs> I was just thinking that's quite an intriguing claim that Ireland has no snakes. <laughs> but I, I also okay, know, like, maybe. my understanding of that was that was prophecy that they would, that the descendants of the believer from the family of Pharaoh would go to Palestine and reclaim Masjid al Aqsa mm. to the Mu'mini with the Bani Israel. <laughs> and, and that me, and because I know, like, the I know, like, the quotes from the Are we Torah about to just, declare a full blown out uh, jihad and a reconquista? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know, like, I, I would say that if the DNA test comes back positive, the, not for coronavirus, but for. <laughs> But for the Irish being the descendants of this ancient Egyptian Jew, I am hoping it does have mm. positive political outcomes. And the reason That's I interesting. Inter- mm. the reason I would say, Mufti, that the my interpretation of the story about the the descendants of the Bleep from the family of Pharaoh being promised to reclaim Masjid al Aqsa and stuff is because the meta- the word snake was a metaphor for disbeliever and stuff. And also okay. it, and also interestingly <laughs> enough in in, a, in the ancient Irish texts I've been looking mm. at, they refer to non-Christians as Gentiles, gentilly. Okay. And I've been reading about Celtic Christianity, and they also did observe kosher practices and believed in the in Tawhid and not the Trinity. <laughs> well, there you have it, people. Right here, Lucy has <laughs> has connected the dots. So <laughs> yeah. So and I am hoping that I yeah I am. I know, like I know, like I've told this story to both the Jewish and Muslim audience, and Jews sometimes get more excited than Muslims when I tell them the story of the believer from the family of Pharaoh for some reason. And I'm, I'm, I could tell, like as there were both Jews and Palestinians there, I could sure. tell that they both communities quite like to hear the story, and I could tell, oh, it looks sure. like they would accept Irish arbitration of the Israel-Palestine conflict, and I think I mean, that Israel, Ireland, I mean. I- Ireland is a very uh, seen very friendly to uh, and and very supportive to the Palestinian cause generally, uh, and mm-hmm. b- but one could argue that's because they simultaneously have gone through a struggle uh, against, let's say, whether it's you know Britain or other forces, and therefore they've kind of they see that f- a friend in in another victim, but. Yeah, but Lucy, that's been very interesting. Shukran for sharing I've that with us. I've also got another story to tell you. <laughs> You've got more. Family for yes. Pharaoh. Yeah. More. When, there's there's when, more dots to connect. I thought yeah, you resolved when the it all now. Happened, I know like the one tafsir I was reading said that the believer from the family of Pharaoh was the treasurer of the ancient Egyptians at the time. And and I know like the um, the Israeli art says or the Irish text said that says that he helped the children of Israel escape Egypt by providing them with wheat and gra- mm-hmm. with wheat and um, grapes. Sure. No, I mean no, definitely. You know, uh, Lucy will just bring on one two other quick people just before the sahur. <laughs> time frame but yeah. uh shukran uh, for Allah sharing that us with this research of course and... i dearly appreciate all that uh information and research that's it just keep keep shaking the foundations of known 
anthropology and history. <laughs> yeah, and and inshallah we'll and inshallah we'll be able to in inshallah right yeah. yeah. And and, uh, and, and uh, anything interesting, do share it with us, okay? You yeah, take and, care. And Allah, and Allah guide us and Allah Amen. If, if Amen. this DNA test proves true then may Lend it be your, a, a light to go. the world you never know take very good care of yourself Lucy salam allahi alik okay all right people there you go uh, we've got new histories being made all right so Lucy shaking up the foundations of known anthropological history people right there uh, we've got, yes, sir. All right. We are, I know people are probably thinking, yeah, we've got sahur to do as well. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, yes, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. All right. Where are you joining us from? Oldham, Sharif. From where? Oldham. Oldham. Allahu Akbar. Ahlam wa sahlan. This is the one people. This he look. All this today, so many of of the blessed Brits are awake. Allahu Akbar. Talk to us, Yasir man. Share your thoughts, or what would you like to say? Uh, no, two comments. One Go is that uh, I've been watching a, a number of your videos, Allah. and I feel that you've done injustice. Uh, <laughs> is it? Yes, that's the story of my life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to us. What's the what's the what's the injustice? Injustice. The two topics, as you were mentioning about psychedelics mm. and uh, and spirituality. No, you think I, you think I left you think I left some psychedelics out whilst mentioning it? <laughs> uh, okay. Yep. The and issue, what we, the contention, the contention I have is this. Yeah. Like you obviously have experience with psychedelics, and obviously I can't contend with that. That's your experience. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> in regards to spirituality, I think you've kind of put people off from being able to experience those very things. It's not outside of the realm of organic Islamic practice to arrive at those experiences at all. Mm. In fact, okay. It's very straightforward. The only issue is people don't know. But can, can I can I can I ask, Yasir? Uh, obviously, okay. Let's let's not ask. Let's not ask. But let's say, <laughs> is your research <laughs> based on uh, experiences of uh, the psychedelic realm? No. You see, my contention is not with what you're saying about the psychedelics. My contention is what you're alleging about the spiritual accessibility from traditional Islamic practices. They're two different points. You're mixing them up. Right. But do, do you feel that, do you feel I uh, say that there is no reality to the spirituality without psychedelics? No, no, no. Let's be very specific here. Yeah. What I'm saying is, with your experience of psychedelics, say, for example, and being in union, and those type of experiences that people who have near-death experiences experience, and all these things, what I'm arguing, my contention is, that it's very, it comes across as dismissive within your discourses, that those are not accessible within the organic practice of... Is, but they're uh, not. You know, that's not true, Mufti, because what you're they're doing not. is... What you're saying is what you're actually what you've just said. I'm going to quote your word yeah, there. Yeah. They are not. That They're is not. subjective to you. That is subjective. <laughs> yeah. That is subjective. So, Do one minute, Mufti. Sure. Oh no, please. That, that is that is subjective. Specific to your experience. Yes. No, oh no. no. That's not. No. That, that, that's what I'm saying is within the day to day practice mm -hmm. of Islam with guided assistance. Yeah, mm -hmm. with guided assistance, without psychedelics. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, and I, I say this, obviously I'm going to be on, uh, this is not something that, you know, I didn't really want to come on live, I'll be, I'll be very honest with you, it's not, well, I'm doing this just for the sake of justice to the topic, is very, very, very straightforward to arrive at those experiences in an organic manner without psychedelic masla kya hai that the people masla kya hai yaar masla is that people have gone through the books and they're trying to study a matter which is experiential the Prophet mm. is the master 
of the prophets must of existence and the must of the teachings the, in their small narrations people dismiss uh you know there's a darkness created in the heart you know is nothing so mm. even though i'm very for these uh, the lenient teachings so that the uh, you know the, right the, okay the, yes sir, just one moment right one. allow me to because i i heard your piece here so just to be clear just to be clear i have always affirmed that spirituality if we want to call it spirituality let's say uh, is a thing i've affirmed that always uh, so i'm just going to lay out my cards yeah i've also affirmed that meditation or these things or mindfulness or dhikr or muraqaba or whatever you want to call it is a thing and lifelong practices do lead to a um the state of mind i i've affirmed that always however i have mentioned that psychedelic experiences um are like a uh, one they are like a shortcut portal to the qualitative um immersion that one experiences is unparalleled you can't just experience that through breathing exercises or meditation and this isn't just subjectively speaking this is scientific so you can see you can just google the brain uh, fmri scans ct scans different scans whilst people are on psychedelics and whilst people are meditating you'll actually find it uh, they're not it does not it's not the same that there's actual new neural networks that are being made when people are on certain psychedelics so it's not qualitatively the same but it can mimic it so there's certain research done in europe after psychedelics were prohibited uh some of the researchers shifted to breathing and meditation exercises and similar to what a lot of the sufis do the chanting you know the <sighs> all this kind of breathing that this is they arouse a similar uh, psychic state now i'm not denying either i'm not saying that no i'm not i'm not saying there is no spirituality without psychedelics i'm not i've never said that uh i'm not denying any or any spirituality and i'm not saying everybody needs to do psychedelics or things like that either um is that what you, i i'm just laying out all the cards here because i think you might have misunderstood maybe what i'm saying i'm i'm open if you're the author of your own words so i can't contend with what you're <laughs> you know you said what, this. what is the exact problem like tell what, me the exact problem and all all of what you said mm -hmm. uh, in you know in order uh, and in that fashion i can't disagree the only one point which is you're saying that the experiences for example you mentioned in exercises within for example your muraqabad etc okay now you're saying that the the other the issues no contentions how you presented them today okay say for example if you take a, a one off psychedelic right this is mm -hmm. the point where i'm going to uh, take your point so you take a one off experience of psychedelic and you have this mind blowing experience and you're saying that this does not compare to per se any kind of meditative pr practice and you say there's evidence for it okay let's say i agree tiga that you can have an access tiga a one off lack of experience taking a one of psychedelic and it cannot be compared to uh, a a typical routine meditative practice okay, that, no that's but i did state that a, a long developed practice of meditation over years can mimic those those uh, uh psychic states it can mimic it but it doesn't entirely produce it oh, but okay. it can mimic it yeah i'm going to lay the cards out for a person who has <laughs> had an, an opening okay yeah. so for a person who huh? has had an uh, had a spiritual opening spiritual. after after say for the years of practice or whatever he so he has an opening his state is at the same level if not more than the person who's had the sacrifice that's point one okay however that's not an, an end game that's not an end goal for us sorry who, i didn't understand that say, say that again someone who's that's... had an opening who's had an uh, a, cognitive a, a, a spiritual a, a, opening a spiritual opening okay <laughs> someone who's had an opening right <laughs> his his natural state yeah mm -hmm. is deeper than the one who has a psychedelic experience yeah of course not, yeah sure oh, okay. sure sure, 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 sure. No, but, but we're not now i'm not going to advocate not... i'm not going to advocate that because that's not the purpose of our our worship yeah. or our, so... our life just to go for an open mufti please let me just fin sure, uh, sure, take sure. The, so that i don't is, disagree with what you've said i don't disagree so that, with that. So that's the state but for the, the the thing is if you compare the two so you can you've got an option to have an experience with the psychedelic and i'm not knocking psychedelics by the way i'm not i'm saying mm -hmm. they halal haram that's not my issue i'm not mufti sure. you're the mufti I'll, I'll leave you to that 
So if we get, agree on everything you said before, and the fact that the person who has a spiritual opening through traditional practices or through the routine, uh, routine method, for example, his his experience is then sustained throughout his life. He doesn't need to rely on any tertiary. That he's in that state. That he's in that reality. Okay. So that's one thing. The other the other thing is the understandings that accrue over time with the practices are more deeper than the person who has a psychedelic one of experience because the person who has a psychedelic experience he has that uh what do you call it a, 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 an experience of euphoria one and two of union Tiga, mm -hmm. this is for people who've had the psychedelics they will understand what i'm talking about sure. so they have experience of union but how to understand the metaphysics of cause and effect in the spiritual world or deeper mm -hmm. how to deal with emotive issues or how to understand life those are things that accrue on the in the organic manner you're not just going to get them from yes, let me just uh, allow me to to add something look right we're not actually disagreeing on anything here this is why i was asking what is the actual uh, problem you see these are two different realms they're different worlds the people today who experience psychedelics often are not religious people like people of organized religion or institutionalized religion. Institutionalized religion has mo mostly banned psychedelics. So they're not the same worlds, institutionalized religions. I don't mean like the shamans and people of other faiths, right? So yes, of course. So today psychedelics are popular amongst what kind of people? Either recreationally for fun or either in some shamanic practices or either in people seeking consciousness and you know new age enlightenment so these these people are not people of aqida and people of tasawwuf and people of religious spirituality so they're not going to go down that road because they're not people from that background so I've argued that people in the past, like Ibn Arabi, like Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, were on psychedelics. That's my argument. I Obviously, I've got a detailed video highlighting the evidences for that. But you see, this is why they saw these things that they saw and described them. And this is why it didn't make sense to people, because people who ain't on them, it wouldn't make sense to them. So to, to summarize this, I clearly agree, clearly, that if you are a person of a practice, of an order, of a, you know, of a religion, and you, let's say now as a Muslim, you worship Allah, you pray nafal, you do all these things, you do all this tazkiyah, you do dhikr, your understanding of Islam is going to only be more spiritualized as you keep going along this road. You know, as you do more dhikr, more kind of meditation, more things. Somebody who goes on mushrooms or takes DMT or drinks ayahuasca is not going to come out as some kind of uh, awliya Allah. You know, like he's not going to come out doing dhikr and praying tahajjud because he was not on this path to begin with. I had only argued that there should be a merging of these paths, that people should, that they that they can help each other, that there's an inter kind of locking that could take them further. That's all I had argued. I'm not saying you become more muttaqi by going on these things. Obviously, you don't in that sense, in the, in the religious sense, you know, you're not going to. So I agree with you, you know, doing people doing dhikr or parts of tasawwuf tariqahs or things like this, you know, carry on. I mean, I'm, I've never spoken against that in saying that that's not going to lead you to a heightened uh, religiosity. It is. Okay. Uh, I... Uh, I think the point about Ibn Arabi is a bit unfair. And just uh, an open <laughs> invitation, there's uh, uh, the... I, 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 you know, I don't know how to contact you uh, on a personal level, but uh, Instagram, are, but Instagram's I, a good one. I don't really use that for personal, uh, you know. But yeah, yeah, uh, yes, you know, it, you know the, the point, uh, Mufti Sada, you made about, uh, for example, Sheikh Ibn Al Arbi, and you know their experience. You thought they're in psychedelics. I just, I'm going to give you an open invitation. I'll give you an invitation to a place. Within three days, you can take yourself and any 20, 30 people. Okay, this is an open challenge. Anyone, whether it's <laughs> online, uh, whether, okay. whether they're online, whether they're offline, in person, off person. So if you want to gather 50 people, we'll do, we can have an experiment, right? And I'll, 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 we'll arrange it, right? 
and we'll, I'll tell you within three days, these people have an experience that they haven't had in their life, right? The, the spiritual mag magnification of their experience, whatever they've had in their life, right? They'll mm -hmm. never have it. Just to prove okay. the point, just, Mufti Zab, just sure. to prove the point that these, uh, that Sheikh Ibn al Abid, this is not about Saka. I know you, I, unlike other people, I'm not going to slay you. Alhamdulillah, I know you've got the sincerest of intentions and you've got no mm -hmm. khalal in your kind of, uh, you know, intentions or you try to slay this. I'm, I'm just assuring you that these people... And I'm not genuine. saying, this is just, look, I'm just putting stuff out there. Obviously, I am an advocate of these things, uh, but I, I'm just putting it... I'm not saying people need to be taking this route. You know, a quick a quick point there with what you're saying, Yasir. You see, it's, it's actually very interesting... You know, let's say this, what is it, a, a two-night challenge, three-night challenge, whatever whatever this trip is. Yeah, three nights, yeah. The, the practices that will happen in this place, right, I bet you will include things like certain breathing rhythms, certain chanting, certain... Now, it's interesting that none of these things have actually been taught in the Qur'an wa Sunnah, that these are just practices that ulama or people of tasawwuf developed along the way. Where did they develop them from? They just develop them from meditative practices, you know, like even the whirling dervishes or even the dhikr like this and that. This isn't actually in the Quran or Sunnah, but this is just practices. People manage to kind of induce a hypnotic trance by doing this and breathing and saying certain chants and they've passed it on. It's not actually very different to what I've said uh, or what I've kind of encouraged as well, because... Man. Uh, yeah. What I was saying is about the point you made about Sheikh Ibn al-Arabi. Uh, oh, you okay. were saying how these people were probably in psychedelics. The point I was making, not it was not the point I was making that uh, these people had it all organically. And what you're saying about their practices that these weren't transferred by the Prophet وسلم, and it hasn't it hasn't authentic sunnah. I'm actually a very big advocate of sunnah as it was received okay mm -hmm. so it was something to be against the letter of the law and something to be against the spirit of the law and I'm, I'm this is all transferred none of this anyone who has any type of ism they cannot transfer any level of spirituality unless that ism is going back to the prophet so it's not willy-nilly experience and that was my contention mm -hmm. about sheikh ibn al-albi none of their kind of thing was oh i'm gonna try to get this it doesn't work like that Mufti Shab. I'm yeah, it, i know that's your academic yeah. way you kind of that's your conclusion have but you watched could, my have you watched my uh, research on that you see the way to understand this is obviously this research is being done through objective thought like we are looking at something like detectives and trying to figure out what happened like you come in a room some things are scattered windows broken now you don't know what's happened but you're you're guessing you're looking at the evidence. Now, what you do is you look at what these people wrote. Okay. The kind of things that they describe themselves as seeing and witnessing, like Rumi describing his drink, the harmala seed that he often speaks about is a Mao inhibitor. Did you know that? Right. So the harmala that he has, uh, that he says that I filled my glass to the rim with harmala is a Mao inhibitor that I gets activated, that activates the DMT if you consume it. And his nay, his flute, which I show the, the common kind of bamboo that was used, contains not only DMT, but 5-MeO-DMT. Now, even if traces by constantly, uh, let's say, uh, with, you know, in his lips were to kind of be ingested with the Mao inhibitor of the harmala seed, it would activate small levels of what is microdosing. Now they wouldn't know what they wouldn't know what they were doing. They wouldn't think, oh, by the way, this is something which, oh, look, I've got a DMT thing here, and this harmala seed that I'm having is a Mao inhibitor. They wouldn't know that. But this was just a practice that they would they would think it's the gathering that's inducing this. Uh, you know, these hallucinations. So look, but I've got a whole detailed video. I'm not knocking. I think the problem with people of organ institutionalized religion is they feel that if we argue that psychedelics may have induced these states, that their institutions of religion start to lose value. And I think that's not true. I think they've misvalued uh, because really the Dean offers something which is incomparable but just because people may have aided their experiences using the world around them and they, it's like you use coffee to stay awake 
You understand? It's not, it's a stimulant, but it's from the world around you. So are these things. I mean, they, they, they're natural things found in nature. But yeah, inshallah. Yes, I want to apologize to all the viewers for taking that much time. I wasn't expecting to be on for so long. I'm, I'm very <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. You know what you're saying about your uh, the organized religion. I just felt that someone say for them watching uh, watching here. I'm not. Uh, I don't feel that psychedelics are a threat or this is a threat. I just feel that the, the way one of your answers came across on one occasion, mm -hmm. it kind of. Other people will think, yeah, namaz barsanta o cheez nahi milegi. Well, I can tell you that as he baat nahi hai. I I just wanted to give the other people. Bilkul bhi nahi, yar. Namaz mein jo maza hai kya? No, I totally agree. And just to be clear for people, I've never ever said, and and you can you can find any clip of mine. I've never said that um that that religion or its spirituality that it offers is something useless or something that cannot be found or cannot be met or cannot. I've never made these claims. In fact, I've encouraged it. And I've even said, look, I'm not the best person to go to for uh, religious spirituality. Um, <laughs> you know, spirituality. But people, Yasir, for that, we have to come to your uh, three-day camp, inshallah, in Oldham. All right, so it's it's been epic, Yasir. I'll quickly Thank let you one to the guys. You, can you, you take care, man, and reach out to me if you're on Insta or anything. Have Let's you got connect. an email address or something? I'll, I I can send it. Yeah, email. it's uh, yeah, it's mufti mm -hmm. at gmail dot com. I'll Hits send you email, mufti. Sir. <laughs> take Thank care you, of man. yourself. Inshallah. Okay, salamu alaikum. People, Yasir, right there, a very interesting discussion. I know it is getting uh, late for people as well. Uh, let's get on. Oh, you know what? I've had uh, waste, waste. You're doing it. You're doing it. Ah, oh, salam alaikum. <laughs> Allahu akbar. <laughs> waste. Where are you joining us from? I'm from Toronto. Toronto. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It looks like you're sitting right there, chilling out in nature in some Amazon. I know. <laughs> Amazon <laughs> forest. <laughs> About to take uh, some DMT right there. <laughs> what is going on? So I was actually listening to your uh, discussion with this other brother. Um, you know, I it reminded me of uh, religion being the opium of the masses. Mm. And I was like, okay, do we need more of that? <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, I, I think more of it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I feel that the the issue is that you see, organized religion, institutionalized religion, it feels that it has a lock on people because there's a need, you know, this opium of the masses. And they feel that spirituality is their domain. And it's their monopoly almost. And now in this new age rediscovery of these kind of what are called entheogens, you know, these kind of products that you can consume and they connect you with God. Religions feel that, oh, my God, you know, is this our territory slipping away from us? And so they, you know, it doesn't matter what faith people like they clamp down on it and no. And, and I just feel that, look both have their value you know a religion religious spiritual meditative practices are lifelong practices you know they're not something which uh and they give you a whole narrative you know god is watching you god is blessing you i mean you're not going to get that just by eating a mushroom you know you're not going to just think oh god is th th this is a narrative it's a psychosocial narrative that's it's it's driving you along in life, making you a better person. But uh, uh, yeah. sorry to uh, sorry to interject. No, no, you, no, but no. Um, uh, uh, how about the amal uh, shaitan that you know um, all the muhadarat, all the uh, intoxicants and the musakarat and everything yeah. in the Quran? You know, it's uh, it's said that ritual uh, in amal shaitan. Yeah. So yeah. how do you justify that? But we say this is the good rich. <laughs> 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> Rich means like filth <laughs> in Arabic. In Arabic, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> for a moment, I almost sold it. 
people. <laughs> no, yeah, this is the, this is the good ridge. That's the other one. <laughs> no, so um, I do explain uh, in my kind of video on this uh, psychedelics. It's on YouTube. I do explain that there's nothing in Islam that clearly prohibits um, psychoactive substances. So. You see, they are not an intoxicant in the sense of like, they, they are not alcohol. Now, one could say, well, okay, they are not alcohol, but uh, they have an impact on your brain. And that is true. They are psychoactive. But you see, but at what point does one draw the line? So like coffee is a stimulant. It's, uh, you know, it has a an impact uh, on the brain in, in uh, you know, in what it does. So. People could say, well, okay, hallucinogens are haram. But then the question is, well, where do you get that from? That hallucinogens are haram because you would need a nas from the Quran because alcohol is not a hallucinogen. It is a depressant. And even though it does, it makes a person, you know, be completely, obviously you lose, uh, you become completely incoherent and you, you lose your sense of or your control over the senses. It is not the same with psychoactive uh, substances. Now, one could say they interfere. So I accept that they interfere. But then in saying, well, coffee interferes and you could say, well, that makes it more positive. Well, well, one would say, well, these are not. You know, I know some people can use them recreationally, but these things are entheogens. They connect one to God and make one's life more positive. I mean, now recent studies show uh, psilocybin is as powerful as any drug in curing depression. Now, and yeah. how do you how do you respond to La taqrabu salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lam ma taqulun? So we we just stop with La taqrabu salat. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. <laughs> no, so joking. The reason why I'm saying this, Mufti Saab, yeah, and I totally, yeah. no, I totally sure. understand your perspective, yeah. and I respect what you're doing and what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, much, much love from that side. No, but that's a very I'm good not, question. Not that's a very no, and I know you're not. I know yeah. you're not. I can just tell by the wonderful background you've got right there. It's all <laughs> so in harmony with nature. <laughs> you see, yeah. I think it's an yeah, amazing my, my room question you're terrible. asking. That's why I had to. <laughs> Allah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing question that, look, people will say that what about rulings like La Taqrabu Salah? Well, you know, Wa Antum Sukara. Now, first of all, I would say you're not Sakran in these things. You're not drunk. However, it is true. It is true. They, you may not, you know, they, they may interfere in one praying Salah. Um, but that's like anything. You know, it's like anything. Like one could argue that, look, uh, from a simple natural phenomenon to sleep, interferes with Salah to something like having to work a particular job or do a particular thing. Now, obviously, you'd have to time it. <laughs> no, no, okay, but, but you'd uh, have to plan condition, it accordingly. Because... The condition in the Quran is hatta ta'alum ma taqulun. And I believe, yeah. I personally believe, it is illegal in the secular societies to be drunk and drive driving, mm -hmm. even if you're under the influence of psychedelics or mm -hmm. marijuana or you know, alcohol, whatever kind. Mm -hmm. If your mind is not in its right place, it's illegal to drive. Mm -hmm. So the same con concept applies when it comes to hatta ta'lum ma taqulun. You have yeah. to know what you're saying in your salah. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Okay. Now, when you're having psych uh, psych uh, psychedelics, that salat, because uh, to me to personally, because I don't consider hadith as source of my religion. I've discussed this one sure. time with you. So mm -hmm. to me, salat is aqimus salat, that five time, you know, uh, uh, that the awqat of the salat are fixed. That's one, I believe. And then I also believe, alladhina hum fi salatihim daimun. You have to constantly salat with lam alif, which is constantly turning towards Allah and turning towards uh, the, the Quran and ayat and applying that in your life. So you cannot be fi salatihim daimun constantly being towards your, you know, to, uh, yeah. facing towards Allah SWT and towards ayat. If Allah SWT says, don't even consider a salat wa antum sakara because you don't understand mm. what you're going to say. You're not I, I agree. Look, you see, Imam al uh the great um, Maliki legend, 
Right. Now, he highlights uh, in his book, Muafaqat, um, he clearly demonstrates that he has this principle called faqihun nafs, that a person is like you are the best judge for when something is suitable for you, as in it's your call. Let's sum it up with it's in it's your call. So I, I'm feeling too poorly, too sick to 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 pray. According to who? According to you, it's your call. Okay. Very good point. Now uh, this faqihun nafs. So as to so first of all, the question that yes, psychedelics now they vary. They may vary in their time spans. So whether. It's four hours, five hours, six hours, whatever they are, or whether 15 minutes, maybe, you know, the way some DMT is uh, is taken. They may not interfere at all with Salah times, or maybe they, they may take a span of four or five hours. So four or five hours, okay, but people, first of all, people... Uh, there's a number of things here. They could they could take them at a certain time that it doesn't concur with salah, just as they do. Or it does. It's not an intoxicant. Okay. Now, obviously, different experiences are different. Now, to some people, they you know that there's obviously a kind of spectrum of this so-called uh, the walking the path or the trip. You know, it's not. And people are conscious, and they are in tight. They're not like tipsy or they they can. Absolutely speak, they can, they absolutely in this state. You know, you said, most people will know, you know they know what they're saying in that state. Mm -hmm. Now, you may say, well, okay, what about things like uh, driving? Would you compare it to driving? I personally wouldn't, uh, because you see, there's certain things in which you are still very much know what you're saying and doing. Uh, like I could be slightly sleepy, slightly, and I know what I'm doing, and I can just do wudu, but I'm tired, and I'm and I'm praying, but being slightly sleepy and driving because driving is a an activity which involves the road and other people, and your reaction time, even a second delay, could cause a crash and an accident and loss of life. So I wouldn't compare the two, but I would say that if a person felt that they could pray, they can pray. If a person felt that no, they they can't, and they'll pray. Uh, you know, they organize their time. That's entirely up to them. But obviously, I don't know. Uh, this <laughs> we ended up speaking a lot today about psychedelics. I don't know why. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> is it because reason, it's the, the blessed, my, uh, <laughs> the blessed nights of Ramadan? <laughs> the reason why I'm getting uh, getting back with you, actually, on on this uh, is not this. It just so happened that we talked about, it. and I totally understand. Yeah, you know that that prayers is not exactly the same as driving because in driving you have to be very alert, mm -hmm. uh, in in a sense that one slight mistake could cause somebody's life. But anyway, let's leave it at that. I don't. I cool. don't no, like it's it. been a pleasure, ways. It's <laughs> been then, epic. But uh, so. but is it okay if I ask you one more thing? <laughs> Chalo yar, go on then with that background. Okay. But I've got I've got a few people waiting. Okay, so I'm just I gonna be very quick on this one. This is about um, a text I also sent you in the Instagram about Ozaira mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, I've seen your point of view about Ozaira that it could be Osiris. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You have said that, and I yeah. actually have thought about this as well. Actually, when I was going to school, I was debating with a friend and. He said, oh, the Quran says this. And I was like, uh, and uh, I said, okay, what, what about it? He's like, uh, no, the Jews never worshipped uh, Ozea. There's no, no Jew that does yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was kind of dumbfounded at that time. And it, since then, it has been in the back of my mind. I actually looked through the verse. Yeah. And I see if we look at, um, you know, the verse. Uh, that, so it, it doesn't say uh, Isa. It says yeah. Masih, Masih, meaning it's the title, it's the Christ. So mm -hmm. it doesn't use the name, whereas okay. it's not fair to consider Ozair as a name. Because if you put them in an equation, okay. on one side, if there's one title, on the other side, there is another title. It cannot okay. be another name because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so when I looked at if I looked at the meaning of Ozair, Ozair is the same root letter as Tazir, as punishment, or you know, if somebody mm -hmm. has that honor to be able to give you punishment, like a judge kind of a thing. 
then you could call that person, uh, you know, that, that this word could apply to that, that honorable one. Ozer could mean the honorable one. Now, the next verse, it says, mm -hmm. uh, it, it tells you, because uh, So the Jews have taken their mullahs and maulis as, um, as arbab, mendunillah. So it's sure. as if they are considering them as the same title as the Christians give to the Isa, salam, the Christ. Mm -hmm. They call him the son of God, meaning he is the judge and the honorable and he will judge See, you. The only the only challenge that people would say with this uh, ways is that they would say that, look, you know how you said like for like. So they will argue that, uh, you see, th the way Christians do perceive Jesus Christ is not just the it's not the way they perceive their priests. Because the, the priests and the rabbis are like for like, you know, the pope and maybe some high high rabbis and high priests and um, and are like for like. But they, it's not the same. Uh, I'm just saying from a from that verse perspective, because if you look at it, it does seem that there was some figure that it seems by the reading that there's some body or something that the Jews gave such a glorification to. Um, I felt that this was not referring to Jews as a whole. It was referring to the early Jewish people who left with Moses, them, because they most likely would have, uh, if it is Osiris, they would have had a great deep embedded love and respect for Osiris, just as all people of Egypt would have had, because he was this great, you know, the one who blesses for uh, for food and for blesses. He's the Lord of the underworld. He's the kind of Rahim equivalent of of their narrative. So, and and you see in the Quran when the Jews when Israel go with Moses, one of the first things they ask is, "Oh, make us a uh, you know this kind of statue." This when they see whether it's the tree or they see something, "Ijalna ilahan aliha," as the Quran quotes them, that they say to Moses, "Hey, can't we have a god that looks a bit like that?" Um, so it, you see, the reason I feel Allah is mentioning these things is to show that those deeply embedded traditions were still with them like somebody doesn't just jettison everything you know they they move along but they still carry this stuff with them but yeah i i um uh, i see what you're saying as well yeah but, but uh, just so just the last point and i totally understand you know that this point is not that it's that strong i'm just uh, uh you know i just came up with it uh, a few days ago and i was thinking about it i wanted to share it with you and get your perspective i checked on uh, surah fat uh, on uh, verse number nine this word is used again, okay? And this one is لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُعَزِّرُوهُ وَتُوَقِّرُوهُ وَتُسَبِّحُوا بَكَرَةً وَعَسِيلًا So this تُعَزِّرُوهُ yeah. is used here. Yeah, yeah. No, so so it's not, yeah, everybody except, so the Arabic word تَعْزِير mm -hmm. uh, it does come from to punish or to chastise. Yes. Uh, the question is that, so Uzaid seems like an Arabic name, okay, because it's a Sigatul like Tasri, the, the uh, like the name Awais on this pattern, or Junaid, or, you know, these kind of names fit this pattern of Fu'ail, so Uzaid. Now, the question is, was this, it clearly wasn't an Arab, because the Israelites are not Arabs, so it's a non-Arab word non-Arabic word of origin. Now, one of the ways that they did use, to, this is why I said Osiris, is they did, one of the Arabicizations of that was Usair. Usair is actually how, because Osiris, you know, the is, is the Greek ending. No, if it's, you accept actually, it as a name, then yeah. absolutely you're right. Yeah. But if you think that Quran, you know, it, it could be, it could be a name, it could also be a title, but if it is a title, it definitely is, because this word fath, uh, in, in Surah Fath, uh, this uh, it means to, uh, honor. It does not only mean chastise and punish. Oh, right, yes, yes. Uh, okay, as in to, to from the... Um, yes, mm -hmm, so support, those people yeah. who consider Allah and His Rasul as the honorable one, as mm -hmm. opposed to others. So this, 
honorable one, you have to consider Allah and His Rasul. That's the word of Rasul is the Quran. Uh, yep. The Quran is the Holy Rasul Karim. So if you consider it that way, then uh, so, uh, yeah. Allah and His Rasul come on top. And anybody, anybody that's, else, if somebody is holding somebody else as that honorable one, then they you become are kind of giving a kind them of that. Rifle. Okay. But I don't Shukran want to take ways. more of your time. Shukran, man. Like, oh, Take care of yourself. Wassalamu alaihi alaik. All right, people. Uh, right, we've got to start wrapping this up. We've got IMG Guru. IMG Guru. All right, Guruji. Guruji. Assalamu alaikum. Salam, salam, Mufti Sahib. How are you? I'm good. Guruji, kahan se bol rahe aap? Where are I'm you speaking from, from? Australia. Your first uh, meetup. I came on. And I just chatted with you. I didn't ask you a question that I had, and I'm still regretting it. It's like being what yeah, six or well, seven months. Didn't you? Well, since Guru, ho jao shuru. What does the IMG had, stand for? Ah, oh, this is the name I kept in like high school or something. I okay, still had okay, it okay, in okay, my account. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, Go yeah. for it then, Guruji. Yeah, but what my like question will won't be as big, you know, like these uh, existentialist ones you had, and then psychedelics and. Wow. Yeah, we've had we've had uh, Arj, you know what it is people's brains they, they're on like some mega caffeine tonight <laughs> Allah, Allah, Allah. Uh, anyway uh, I'm, I'm just gonna ask you a question and it's, uh, it's like a lohui question from the Quran okay so mm -hmm. this is a verse in surah hajj uh, surah 22 <laughs> verse 40 so mm -hmm. it starts out of Allah and then rajim bismillah uh, so my question is uh, we compare yeah we compare across the Quran we know salawat means hafiz wala salawati was salat al musta like protect your it's of it's used as protect your prayers and especially mm -hmm. the prayer in the between and then it's also used as ulaika alayhim salawatum min rabbihim wa rahmah mm. yeah. so, of course here you we can't say it means prayers since god uh salawatum min rabbihim salawatum min rabbihim on the yu'minun on the people who believe so my question in this verse is like all every single translation i see mm -hmm. big big Translation, big linguists, they all translate this word salawat in this verse as synagogues. Hmm. synagogues. Hmm. Is that so the, the is that the, the is it not the monasteries and the yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. The, so this is my question for you. Like, is this justified from a linguistic point of view, from a Loghui point of view? Saying that salawat means synagogues. Um Right, so let me just bring up the the entire yeah. verse again. Right, let me just bring it up. Right, so twenty two verse forty. Yeah, so um, now, yep, Allah di nohri jo min tiari him bi gayri haq. Right, so um, this is uh, Tabari. He says, um, mm -hmm. he gives, um, so, uh, right. obviously showing the diff dis disagreements of people. So he mentioned sawami to mean the uh, maybe where the monks were, but he says there's yes. ikhtilaf amongst people, um, and He's just mentioning some some other people. He's showing all the differences. Some people say it's the place of the Sabi'in. Um, mm. those who were the Sabi'in. Now what Bia the, he says Bia yeah. is for Nasara for Christians, Nasari, but then yeah. once again he says they disagree. <laughs> There's going to be obviously a lot of uh, disagreement. He's showing all the other Opinions as well that people say some beer were churches. Salawat, once again, he says, uh, Some say churches. Um, mm. 
and he mentions some mentioning that and then he says um yahud synagogues um as the uh, transmits qatada says uh, synagogues as well um and he says qala akharun some say masajid al sabi'in it's from the sabi'in again um right but okay so so basically it's like a physical what, what we have is uh yeah that allah is mentioning that the nature of the verse is that it is from the laws of an unwritten law of nature almost that there will be this antagonism yeah uh that people and creatures will be will go up against each other but where there's oppression there will always be some so now we're bringing it in that's zooming out from a creature realm zooming in into a human realm where there's morality where there is oppression some people walaula dafa'ullah an-nas ba'dhum bi ba'd that there will be some people that will be inspired to rise for the cause of justice and allah will cause them to repel the other people that there will always be forces fighting for justice in this world and then allah uh, exemplifies gives as an example different places of worship that are being destroyed and these words that are used like sawami bia now apart from uh, you know salawat and apart from masajid but the others it's not very clear what these words are exactly referring to uh, you're right that as 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 tabari highlights that look ikhtalafa ahlu ta'wil ikhtalafa ahlu ta'wil ikhtalafa you know everybody they they're not sure does this mean a church does it mean a synagogue but we get the impression that it's referring because allah says yuzkaru fi ismillah kathiran that these places of remembrance are places which in which the name of god is being glorified yet they are being destroyed by some forces mm. and it's interesting that allah mentions about all of them and i would say that they incorporate beyond the abrahamic faiths whether it's going to be any faith any kind of yes. monastery yes. or any kind of place of and this is why these words were used even right out to shamanic practices or anything mm. any body any kind of gurudwara uh, gu- uh, gurudwara or langar uh, they're getting yeah, all langar whether any communal place where people congregate to glorify allah god in their understanding these places being attacked allah is condemning it and it's interesting mm. in that verse allah is not just condemning those he begins by it's you know it, it looks like it's it's it begins with muslims you know ladina mm. those people ukhriju min diyarim and one might picture oh the hijra and muslims being forced to leave from makka and th- this might come to you know al mutabadir ila dhahn that that which comes to to us uh, immediately but when we read the entire verse it seems to be so generic and universal that we we're kind of like oh whoa okay this is about anybody wherever they are uh, remembering god in their way and if forces of whatever nature of people trying to shut them down destroy huddimat destroyed destroyed yes, physical dem- physically destroyed demolished mm-hmm. demolished yeah. yep sorry uh, the demolition of these places that there will be a people that will rise for justice and i think this is you know it's one of the most amazing verses of the quran to reflect a sense of justice a universal justice universal not this kind of yeah. prejudiced you know oh we're muslims we only stand up for um You know like as an example like let me just say right now I'm just saying like I you know just uh, what's going on uh, in uh, in Colombia and uh, just as an example now Muslims won't really unfortunately a lot of Muslims won't really care you know because they won't see it as anything to do with them because they're mm. not Muslim 
You know, the, yeah. the whole point is that it's well, if it's not Muslim, it's not our cause. Mm. And and that th this verse is speaking against that. Mm. That it's not just because, you know, somebody once asked uh, my position. I mean, I've answered my position on the Uyghur uh, and some I, I read a comment somewhere that somebody said, you know, why is most, you know, about my position and in not being as harsh as other people and but my position is harsh but my position is from a human perspective and i've said that look to me what china is doing yes it, it, it needs to be condemned for its human rights for its torture for these things but i don't feel china is doing this because they're muslims it's doing it because of the separatism it's a political mm -hmm. issue but they are torturing the people who then happen to be muslims and yes, those people may have also used their being Muslim and identity for their separation cause, you know, for, for separatism, for saying we want a separate state. And obviously China is a ruthless entity. They're not going to let you be a separate state. They will crush you. So, yes, I am against it, just as I'm against any oppression. But I don't feel that, you know, people think this is China's jihad against islam it's not if mm. those people happen to be hindu but were calling for separatism yeah. china would have crushed just them just the same they just, the, and they and but they and they may be using islam for their separatism but my point was that you see this is a human issue and yes it needs to be condemned on human rights but this colombia as an example or if we're using let's say if there's human violations going on in other parts of the world people don't care you know they all muslims they will feel well if they're not muslim then it's not our cause so this verse is addressing that bigotry in saying no that you know whether it's sawami bia whether it's masaj whether it's salawat whether it's whatever these places where people have a sanctity that where there is dhulm that people mm. should stand up for it but yeah mm. guru ji that's an uh, epic question Eid mubarak Shukran. in advance <laughs> likewise uh, likewise khair mubarak thank you so much take care Assalamu alaikum. All right, people, we've got to wrap up but i can see here i'll take uh, j maksud j maksud you know what Jay Maksud, I just saw all those books in the background <laughs> and I thought it would be blasphemous. Oh, my not goodness. to. <laughs> Asalaamu Alaikum, Mufti. Thank you so well, much. Wa Alaikum Have you just snuck into a library and just gone live? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 10 30 at night here in New York, so I don't, there's no libraries open. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Wow. So what's going on? Is that your study? Is it Allah? Uh, yeah. You know Allah, what? Is... I, I feel this is not fair. I, I need to turn the camera <laughs> that way. Go into well, my study. You know what? I, it's I, like I was... a showing off thing. Uh, here. <laughs> if I had the filter thing going on, I would totally use it. So uh, <laughs> Mufti, thank you for taking me on. I'm, I'm kind of still shell shocked at the moment that I have the opportunity to talk with you. I'm just a big fan. It's, it's um, I love I love hearing you uh, explain things. Thank you for all of that. So I have a couple of questions. You know, I know time is limited, but the questions are kind of related. So the first one, I'm a teacher myself, and I always think about uh, Islamic education in the 21st century. And what, what does it mean to educate your own children or to give an Islamic education to your children? Like, what's our responsibility in your view? What's the best we can do? especially in, in like a Western context. And a related question somewhat is about, especially in the interfaith a marriage context where your spouse may not be Muslim. What, is, what are the things you People do? are asking, is this Jah? Is that you? Are you the, the no, Jah? I'm not, I'm not Jah. <laughs> are, you, are you Jah Jah, the Rastafari? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I'm not so, as cool. No way. Yep. So, okay. Yep. You're saying, sorry, the second part of the question. Was... Yeah. The second part was just uh, related in the sense that in, in an interfaith marriage context, when mm -hmm. the spouse is not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, naughty, yeah, naughty. Yeah, naughty, naughty. <laughs> naughty. Um, what, ah, what locking are... in all those. Ahlul Kitab women. Is that you, Jay? <laughs> Impressing them with your books. <laughs> <laughs> and let so me show you my small library over here. <laughs> well, on a side note, you know, I saw I saw the tic tac toe uh, artwork back there, and I was going to challenge you to a game of tic tac toe. But then I said, 
you 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 don't follow the rules. It looks like <laughs> <laughs> I would lose. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, what are the sorry, responsibilities? Saying, what are the responsibilities yeah. um, in this in that sort of a situation as well in regards to, uh, you know, uh, giving an, an Islamic education to your children? Right, that's actually a very, um, you know, it's uh, although despite it being a simple, simply put question and and a somewhat perceptibly simple question. I find it to be one of the most, um, you know, challenging, um, you know, <sighs> propositions really that we are faced with. That how do we go about um, teaching our children about Islam? Like, what what is the and being a qualified mufti being a scholar of islam i'm being honest with you i think in some ways it's 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 even more challenging because you know or, or from my perspective I, I i assume i know uh different all these different perspectives and and then there's my take on things and so i'm just i feel that we are all in this together honestly don't think that somebody has a greater ability just because you know he's an alim or he's a sheikh or he's a mufti um i would what i've linked it in okay i'll tell you what i th what i'm thinking yeah now this and i may change my view on this because I, i'm just learning it as i'm going along i'm sure. just being honest with you sure i i wish there was some kind of a a blueprint that that i felt i feel that really there's two things that we need to concern ourselves with one is just the very basic fundamentals that there is a god and the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the very simple fundamentals of islam you know that we we do believe that you know god and, and the simple that god watches over us he protects us he uh you know ultimately uh, provides ultimately and um, all powerful that kind of just very similar uh, which to be fair children kind of gra grasp anyway mm -hmm. they have this understanding of God quite young um, and that we qualify that with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and we are Muslim and to be fair most children will they, they grasp this very young you know my, my daughters learned that in school oh we're Muslim this is what a Christian is this is what this is mm -hmm. they learn this this very simple uh beliefs yeah the other thing and and with that sorry with the very simple beliefs i would just say teaching them how to you know from a young age let's say teaching them certain uh like how to read the quran and stuff and that's a long process but they they you know they're going to learn it and that they'll go through the stuff uh, and that Muslims pray and stuff like that. And that's all that very simple. This stuff, to be fair, is not difficult, and most Muslims all know it. The other thing is to teach them to be a good, to the best of our ability, and it's a difficult one, to be a good human being. Wallahi, like, and I feel that this, uh, to, to aspire to, to these higher, uh, higher values of morality, you know this thing like honesty like justice and i feel and compassion compassion for people compassion for the environment compassion for these things i feel they i, I i'm not quite sure how but i mean there are studies to 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 reflect this as well but i feel that a, a sense of um, ethics is tied in with the child's relationship with their parent that they you know if they have a loving bond uh with the and i i feel the father does play a, a big role in this as well um i feel that even you know there's this uh, i don't know like but it, I, don't, I don't mean a physical presence presence but there is this psych in the psyche there is this this kind of place of the father and 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 the child has this bond and and it's with the mother as well but i'm just saying that the, i feel that if there is this loving connection it 
goes on to, or reflects, it manifests in a, um, a in a better uh, display or a better manifestation of ethics. I, I feel that I, I don't I don't know Allahu A'lam, but there are studies that show that as well. That children that have had that kind of loving bond do go on to be not only stable in and of themselves, but tend to be people that are more concerned with Absolutely. Uh, with compassion and and stuff like this. And you know all the other stuff, like stories in the like you know prophets, stories of the Quran, or what does this mean? What I think personally. I think, look, whatever they learn is fine, alhamdulillah. And as they mature with, with with in life, they will kind of develop that understanding. They'll kind of they'll build on it. They'll they'll you know they'll they'll filter things. They'll learn. I I don't think we need to be. Uh, this is my thought. Be too preoccupied on no no. This is how it is. Or you should memorize all this and you should get. This. I think maybe maybe people. Are, that's working maybe that is a blueprint that some people are going by and and it's working well but this is how i'm just seeing things right now i don't know man it's we're all in this together honestly. i appreciate that and i you know i it sounds also like from what you're saying that perhaps one of the intrinsic goals is to inspire the love of god as opposed yeah. to focusing too much or intensely on rituals and things of that nature that 100%. become okay that is so ex you see i feel that we if you know through this you see i don't I, I have to be careful with my words as well because i don't want to miss kind of uh, represent something but through this bond that i was saying if there is it, it reflects in yes it does kind of manifest in in this kind of ethics but also it, I feel it kind of sets into motion this relationship with God mm -hmm. um, where there is this, um, because what I would want, I would want my children to, to, to know that, to know God as a Rahman al Rahim, mm -hmm. as the loving God, as, as the merciful, as the compassionate, as the, you see, to me, you know, this, um, these rituals and these kind of things that yes they are there for a reason they are not the goal they to me were never the goal of islam they the were just mediums. yeah exactly that's all they are i mean it's not ultimately you know whether a person uh, whether fajr or subah uh, had two raka'at or he had three or he had one ruku and two sujood and these things that these are just rituals just to set for people so they can get by, you know, they can use them as stepping stones to, to have an, a link with God. But 100%, it is the quality which I hope for. And I don't know, you know, because I think kids are a scary one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because the, the other problem is we're in a day and age where the time is changing. So uh, by that, I mean, the age is changing so drastically. We don't even know what's going on. What, And we just about keep up with technology. They are native to technology. You know, we are migrants to, to this technology, technological revolution. And they're growing up around it. And, you know, in 10 years from today, they're going to be so pr perhaps far ahead of us. Um, and 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 that you know this chasm it's difficult to bridge you know it's not easy and um and that leads its own problems you know we are trying to i i was saying once before that i feel for people you know sometimes like your average um especially like your average parent you know I, somebody he, he's not a professor he's not a you know an academic he's not an uh, a scientist I feel sometimes that as their children are growing up, there that there's this that you know there's this kind of like silent suffering of the parent who who feel that the child now starts to know certain things that they can't answer or or even control. And and Mufti, this yeah. th this is one of the reasons why I ask this question because a lot of times a lot of us like the average un. Uh, as less educated in, in religion uh, than most, I guess, professionals or academics. For us, 
a lot of times the religious education is passed on to an institution of some sort, perhaps yeah. a Sunday school or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's where my question kind of really comes from, because a lot of times I have my my children, I have uh, three, but two go to school. And on Sundays they go and they come back and sometimes they have these questions like they, sometimes the textbooks that they're seeing, they're saying things like, you know, you must sleep on the right hand side. If you sleep on the left, <laughs> shaitan will come and wake you up. And God forbid you sleep on your stomach. <laughs> And so I in the to, in the prone position, <laughs> and there's so many things, and and in my in my son's then first the grade, the gonna have a feast. <laughs> yeah, in in my first grade, my first grader's textbook, the Islamic studies textbook, they had a they had the the surah. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the surah, but it was the Zilzalaha that surah uh, yeah. that talks about the, the earthquake. That's the one, and and he they were teaching them in first grade the meaning of that, how God might crush people. <laughs> and so the poor boy came in and he said, mm. you know, uh, uh, he's like uh, he's scared for several weeks talking about like I don't want to go to hell. And they learned that in first grade. So they, these are the mm -hmm. kinds of things that then prompt me to think about, like, should I, shouldn't I be the one trying, even though I you feel know, less I, qualified? I feel, I feel that honestly, you know, a lot of people are asking this question that in the future we will just be, um, we will just become um, cultural Muslims. Some, a uh, few people mentioning that in the comments. I, uh, I, I do. Although I, I acknowledge that the that unquestionably for certain people will be the case. But I see it differently. I see that, you know what we're doing? Like people say, oh, you know, this kind of thing. Oh, well, people are kind of like, you know, they're moving away from just, it's not about rituals. It's more about the meaning. It's more about this. It's more about that. I feel that we are in this decluttering, right? In this searching, we are rediscovering what was in essence the the pure or the pristine message of islam it was actually just to connect and mm. even about atheism you know somebody had mentioned here about atheism they said how richard dawkins uh they gave the example i beg to differ wallahi i beg to differ because i feel that even with this new age um about consciousness and this new age enlightenment that we see people you know the age of militant atheism is kind of it's beginning its demise because people what they want you see people have always had an a heartfelt inherent intrinsic need for god but they just have had enough of institutionalized religion. And I feel that what we're simply doing is people are just losing their chains and shackles. And what they will return to is God. Because a lot of these atheists, you see that now, you see that if you watch some of their interviews, they say, oh, we struggle with the concept of community, the lack of it. We have to invent we have to invent uh, rituals. In fact, a study I was just reading last week about um, certain universities that conducted that most atheists believe in some form of supernatural, whether it's angels or whether it's, uh, you know, the, the demons or whether it's, uh, it's just not God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but there's, because uh, coming to the point that as we, uh, there's there's a, a very um, there is an amazing quote about um, I've forgotten it now but it but it sums up that in the end we arrive where we had begun mm -hmm. uh, but to know it all differently now mm -hmm. that we arrive here now with knowledge and I don't see the future as grim. Uh, I think, yes, it will unquestionably have its challenges, but I don't think it's grim. I don't think people will abandon, uh, you know, like people say, yes, people are, somebody was saying they're going to abandon Islam. Maybe the institutionalized version. And if people don't start offering these other answers, then yes, more and more people will struggle to hold on. But if they do offer these understandings, I feel that people will connect. But yeah, but Jay... Shukran, man. Thank you. It's Thank you for taking the time. Epic, right.
Take Appreciate care, it. man. Salam Over and out, man. Salam alaikum. People, that was Jay Maksud from NYC. All right, guys, we've got to wrap it up. It's gone on way too long. I know you guys are having an amazing time wherever you are. <laughs> right? If you want to reach out to me, Instagram, people. Instagram is a good one. Um, and, yeah, reach out and, and yeah, like and subscribe and follow and on YouTube. <laughs> people, like, subscribe, hit, hit the notification bell, man. <laughs> Guys, much love for uh, uh, Mufti is actually Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> rather. <laughs> Right. Somebody said I missed a comment about where is um, is Mufti from Liverpool because of his accent. I mean, my come on. <laughs> With all love and respect to Liverpool, but <laughs> come on. Um, right, guys, take very good care of yourselves. Much love. God save us from those heathens. <laughs> you pagans people. Right. Go enjoy. Right. Remember me in a kind dua as well. And if you want to reach out, like I mentioned, those are the best channels. Do uh, I am trying to share more and more on YouTube. Do click, click on the bell, man. Click on the bell, people. Wassalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatu ta'ala wa barakatuh, people. Signing out. All right.